Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help Elite FTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. Which I always screw up the name. It's like your guy, right? Or your girl, right? You get assigned this person. So the person works between you and the doctor to be able to determine what you need help with. That could be a CPAP. That could be, you know, just getting your fucking life and nutrition and supplementation in order. All these things can be diagnosed and figured out by talking with this person and looking through your lab panels. Guaranteed your vitamin D probably sucks. Do you know if it sucks? Probably not because you're like, no, nah, I don't want to go to my doctor because my doctor is a pain in the ass. All that can be you know, pre- prevented or avoided if Merrick Health because they have the doctors there. So the sleep thing, yes. The preventative medicine, yes, that's a no brainer. That's basically what they do. If you're a person that blasts shit, you know, are they going to help you blast more shit? No. But are they going to tell you that you need to take less shit? Probably, but they're not going to get on your ass like a doctor and everybody else will. But they will help you to mitigate whatever damage is going on. So then after your meet, competition, photo shoot, or whatever you're doing, then you can pull back and bring things back to normal like they're supposed to be. What you don't want to do is get your blood work done eight weeks after your meet show or whatever it is and, like, prep for your blood work. That's, like, the dumbest fucking shit I've ever heard in my life. Like, take it when you're in full blast mode so you can see how bad you're fucking shit up so then they can help you mitigate that from there if you're drug free is there a reason to get your blood work done of course there's a reason to get your blood work done we'll talk about that as we go through the podcast here today there's a lot of reasons for that because it's still health this isn't just like you know come here to be able to get your trt test prescription there's a lot of other things that you may need help with that Merrick can help you with. So again, it's MerrickHealth.com backslash Table Talk. Link is in the description. The other sponsor is obvious. It's EliteFTS.com. Right now we are closing or getting ready to close the annual equipment sale. We do that once a year. That will end Wednesday. And then we'll kind of roll into the Black Friday specials. So the annual equipment sale is on now at EliteFTS.com. We're also launching two new limited edition items. And one of them I have on right now. The other one is a pull that chit which is a t-shirt that we have out there. The limited edition items directly support the Table Talk podcast. So go to EliteFTS.com. The discount code is Table Talk. Now I'm going to talk to Corey Gregory, which now you're going to see why I like this hoodie so much, because we're going to talk about how he got introduced to lifting weights. You know, he avoided strip clubs and drugs that be able to build a life to make his, his family more secure in the future, right? Because we all know other people, right, oh, yeah. that got into training and then love training. So then they start blasting shit, end up with a stripper, and then feel like they need to blow their head off because their life went the fucking wrong way. Right, so yours went this other direction. So no strippers and Ferraris. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so I got like the storyteller, the storyteller hoodie on, and we also have the the t- a t-shirt with this in white. Link is in the description. Description. Um, yesterday I had about eight stories just pointing at the hoodie, which is cracking so me up. Good. But um, my guest today is Corey Gregory. We're going to talk about a lot of different things. Um, his his life story is. Uh, unique and everybody's got their own personal life story grew up in a trailer basically and then wanted to get out of that life and create a different life for his future generations so busted his ass working in a coal mine for a year or two only six months but it was long enough long enough long (laughs) enough but that the, the the story the thing here is the intent was to save up enough money to be able to go to Columbus State and get a degree in basically personal training, which really wasn't that much of a thing there. So then he goes and he does that, ends up working as a trainer, doing really well as that. Branches off and co-founds Muscle Farm, which you all should be aware of that because it became a huge, huge brand name. 
in the retail space, which is different than what he's doing now. Then from that, made an exit there, started Max Effort Muscle, which is his own supplement company, which is direct to consumer, as yep. well as the training app. Yep. And that's kind of where we sit now. So I just like fast track yeah, 25 yeah. years of um, craziness. And, <laughs> yes, yes. And he just um, he just launched a book which is, you know, how to win at life and, or how to build confidence, confidence. how to win at yeah. life, which I listened to yesterday. And the, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's very simple fundamentals, which we'll talk about. But what I liked about this is after each chapter, he had a little summary podcast, which is 15, 20 minutes, just talking about what that chapter was, which there's more grassroots information in there than the actual chapters. But a lot of these things, a lot of these principles that we talk about with self-confidence and consistency and pushing through adversity and leaning into adversity, all these type of things, they, they sound simple and they, they kind of they are, are simple, you know, to listen to, but they're really, really hard to do. And I think sometimes that gets a little mis- interpreted yeah they're hard people. to execute they're hard to execute consistently yeah, right yeah. where and then there's there's other factors that play into that too where in training one of the first things everybody will say is you have to be consistent you have to be consistent you have to be consistent and then i'll push back and say yeah but we all know those guys that have been in the gym for 20 years and they look exactly the same yeah. way you know they're they're um muscle fat, you know, sloppy fat, yeah. using the same dumbbells, doing the same exercises that they've been doing for 25 years. They never miss. They're always <laughs> consistent. But sometimes that's not enough. You know, yeah. sometimes hard work's not enough. Sometimes, you know, pushing through adversity is not enough. The key thing is to do all of them, yeah. you know, and for that's really kind of time. for a very long time. <laughs> and don't, you know, and here's the other thing. Don't, ex <laughs> this is so fucked up, right? Don't expect results from it. Mm -mm. You know, because it may not come, but that shouldn't be why you're doing what you're doing. You're not so. guaranteed the time frame. That's what I figured out a long time ago, right? First mm -hmm. off, this place is unbelievable, Dave. I've Thank never you. been here. Uh, it's a little bit overwhelming, but what I what I respected when I walked in, it's like the body of work. I see it. Mm -hmm. I see it on all the barbells. I see it on all the different pieces. You see it on all the stuff on the walls. Like, you know, you've been at this a really long time. Uh, I, w I should have came here sooner, so that's my bad. But this is this is fucking yeah. sick, dude. Well, so it's interesting. Congratulations. We've we've been in the same area, yeah, for a long time and never crossed paths, I know. which was interesting when you first DM'd me. It was a, before I made a cigar post. Yeah, and, you know, <laughs> you, all the things. Yeah, 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 yeah. He sends me a message like, "Man, we should sit down and smoke a cigar." I'm like, "Man, that'd probably be a good thing." We've been in the same area for yeah. two fucking decades and exactly. never run into each other, and. So that's how this podcast came about. So while you go back in time to your start, like yeah. how did you get introduced to training? Sure. Then I'm going to light up one of these cigars right. that yeah, you brought yeah. in. Actually, tell me about the cigars. Yeah, that so you this cigar is a super unique uh, cigar. So 10 years ago or so when I worked with Arnold, which was unbelievable, I was at his house for Christmas and I didn't know anybody because I had just started working with Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the MP days. And so I hung out with the cigar guy, and he had uh, a private roller there that would roll for Arnold, Stallone, Bruce Willis, and I made friends with them. And so, you know, I could still get a few here and there. So I told Dave that I think this would be the way for us to kind of, I guess, break bread, which would be cut a cigar. That's kind of what and we're it, doing. Yeah, and it's one that you can't, um, one that you can't just go buy at the store. But this is uh, this is a really, really great draw, smooth, uh, medium body cigar that. There hasn't been one person that's smoked it that hasn't uh, fell in love with it. So, straight up from Arnold's house, can't go wrong. <laughs> so now, how did you how did you get introduced to training? So, what's what's interesting about training is you'll love this, Dave. Like I can remember some of my earliest memories of my parents working out. My mom used to do Jane Fonda records, like in the '80s, right? My dad had. Like the uh, LPs? Uh, like actual, like, yeah, like an actual record, like oh, record wow. player record. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I remember my mom when I was a little kid doing Jane Fonda records and using her rolling pin for an ab roller, like her rolling pin, like she would roll dough out with. Mm -hmm. And she would be doing those. And then my dad, who kind of looked like Super Mario's little Italian dude, he would lift weights in the garage. And, you know, everybody in my family is coal miners and weightlifters. So that's what a lot of people don't know about me is that. I'm a fourth generation, so I grew up around weights, 
but no one did it for their job. Obviously they did it after they came home from working underground all those years. And so it's like all the way back to the 1930s and, uh, actually late 1800s, my great grandfather, Joseph Boone was the first weightlifter in my family. And when he died in a coal mine explosion in 1935 with his brother, Isaiah, so they were on the same shift. They both died. My grandfather, Frank was nine years old, but he was already teaching him how to lift weights at nine. And that was the, so that was already a thing like he was doing in the 30s. And so when my parents got divorced, whenever I was about 11 years old, we moved in with my grandparents. And my grandfather was in his 60s already. And he's the one that said, hey, when I come home from he, he was a coal miner when he was young, but he was like 6'3", so he was too tall for it. He was in construction. When I come back from the job site, we're going to start lifting weights every day after school. Because I was in sixth grade. I was, you know, trying to build confidence. I was trying to figure it out. He said... There's a few things that weightlifting will do for you. It's going to help you build confidence, you know, for the girls. I'll sign me up. Mm -hmm. It's going to, you know, get you stronger for sports. And he's like, this is just what our family does. And he said, so I want you to start. And it was a way I could spend time with him, right, because I needed a father figure too. So he was extremely consistent guy. Every day I come home from work and I'd be waiting. And I'm telling you, I've, I don't even think he really knew that much about weightlifting, to be honest. Mm -hmm. We did reverse curls, curls, calf raises, bench press, like real basic <laughs> stuff. You know, it's like no programming. Yeah. Like, uh, But I remember seeing like one little delt muscle on one day we were doing some upright rows. I think I was fucking sold. I'm like, wait a second. I can spend time with this guy who's my idol, 100% yeah. my idol. And on top of it, I'm, I'm increasing confidence. And I'm like... I literally was hooked immediately. So I'm like 11, 12 years old, looking forward to it. And I've only, I, I, I continued training with, whenever we moved out of there and kept, uh, you know, then I started being able to like study some stuff, some old magazines some things like that. But I haven't missed more than a week's workouts since I was a freshman or sophomore in high school because I locked on when I was in sixth or seventh grade, went straight through to then and then took like one summer off. And since then I've been dedicated to it like, I don't think I've missed more than five or six days like in a row since that day. Like he, my grandfather, Frank, he passed away just a couple years ago at 93. He got to see me build these businesses. He got to watch me squat 700 pounds and multiply. And Louie was in the building. He got to meet Arnold. He got literally, he got to see it go from an idea of a family trait or just a, a way that we operate to an actual business that was like, I don't even know if he could even conceptualize it. And so for me, that was like, like I said, my, my intro to it. And for me to take it to that level and him to experience it, it, it was truly, it was remarkable. When, during, during that time, how did you end up in the trailer? Yeah. Right. So that, so, that gets in his house, right? Yeah. So his house was down the street and that's where we lived there for like six months to a year to, for my mom to get back on her feet. And then when we moved out of their house is when we moved to the trailer. So okay. I moved to the trailer when I was like in set sixth, almost seventh grade. And so here I am. I've got some cement weights. i got no basement. I've got the cement weights literally sitting in the front room. You know, the trailer's from the 70s. And it's uh, the roof's falling in. So my, my, step, or my uncle has to come in and build like a truss up to hold the roof up. You know, it's like my mom's struggling to pay $150 a month rent. And probably, I think at that time, like I couldn't drive yet. You know, I'm maybe 14, 15. And I just started telling myself. And, and what's funny is, Dave, is I don't even know really where it came from. I just started telling myself, like, this is not for fucking me. Like, this is not, this is not how I'm about to continue to operate. Like, my dad was off and on always. He was a coal miner for 16 years and a truck driver. He was always off and on strike. You know, my grandfather was in construction at that time. But his dad had died in the mines. My stepdad was in the mines for 40 years. Like, I watched all these guys work so fucking hard, but not for something they loved. You no, know, my stepdad actually really loved being a coal miner, but he's about the only mm -hmm. one I you know, met. But the reality is like, I kept thinking like, if I can take this work ethic and I can apply it to something I love, and I don't know where this idea came from because you got to figure in 1995, there's no fucking personal training jobs in rural Ohio. Like, no one has a, the guy that owns the gym, you went to it in 98, like he's in the trailer park gym. Yeah, and he, yeah, had, yeah. he had another fucking job. Mm -hmm. he, that wasn't his only job. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, I just remember thinking, I only like lifting weights. I did like sports, but like, that was the main thing I like to do. And I was not going to sign up to then dislike what I did the rest of my yeah. life. And I think that that right there, and then being in that trailer and watching my mom wait tables, have a hard time paying the rent. 
I just thought like, this can't be all that there is. And she busted her ass too and watching her struggle and cry and do all those things. I'm just like, there's got to be a way that I can like shield this and that, like that I'm going to take it on. And that's when it became kind of like my real why that what I would create and what I was willing to do would change the lineage for fucking ever. And I knew that was a lifetime thing I was signing up for, but I literally probably when I was like 14 or 15 was like, I remember seeing what my mom made for the, for the year. I was like, I'm going to make that shit in a month. Like I'm going to fucking figure this out. And if I can just embrace as part of the chapter, embrace mm -hmm. this rage, why I feel so like upset inside every day about not having enough and disliking the car and disliking our house and being embarrassed. I'm like, I'm fucking changing this shit. And so that's why, like when I dig deep and you know, people are chirping or doing whatever, I don't even hear that stuff because when I think back to where this shit really started at, it was so difficult, bro, that to me, like all of this is just a blessing, like to do something that I love and to, and to change what I've changed for my, my family will never be the fucking same. Yeah. Were you able to process when you're that young what your mom actually did though? Because she she took a risk, a big risk doing that. She probably mm -hmm. could have just stayed yeah. with your grandfather, right? Yeah, and sure. then you wouldn't have that mindset. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. she 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 took a huge risk just to kind of say, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna make this on my own. That's no matter no yeah. matter what yeah. I have to do to make it on my own. But you can look back now. I mean, we can look back now and see yeah. that and appreciate it. For sure. Were you able to wrap your head around that even a little bit yeah, when I you think were a younger? Bit because I knew that she, look, no one wants to live with their parents, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't even want to live with my grandparents, and I love them because the rules are different. So I think, you know, she was proud. I even told mom, like, I was like, you know, we probably should have been on, like, government assistance. And I even said that she was too proud. But she later, at the, after she read the book, she goes, no, we were for a short period of time, Corey. Like, I had to had to, you know, get food stamps and do all yeah. that stuff because we just needed it. And so it's like, I was able to wrap my mind around that she was trying to get on without my dad and she was trying to be independent, but man, it was really hard for her. Mm -hmm. And so like her to this day, her highest paying job is she does customer service for that. She okay. has for since 2015. And so like, I take pride in that, that my mom's is like, working at the house whenever she needs to, like, mm -hmm. you know, I just didn't look, I would just give her money if I had to. But at the end of the day, like the reality is like, she's a hardworking, proud lady that busted her ass. I'm like, ma, I need you to learn this and I can pay you good money. And like, probably when I left the trailer back in the day, you never thought this shit would be possible. I'm yeah, paying you yeah. for my online, yeah. you know, but no, I wrapped my head around it. And I just, I just was, it was hard to watch, man. It was hard to watch. But if I don't see that, I don't see us getting kicked out of places you know, that we couldn't afford to end up to that trail. It's like, then I just wouldn't be me. Like, mm -hmm. I, that's why I told her, like, every time I tell these stories, I never wanted to be embarrassed. Because if I don't go through that, I'm just built different because of it. The shit just doesn't, stuff just is different with me. And it's because I went through those things. Like, when I worked underground, you know, I was logging 80, 90 hour weeks. I wasn't even outside when it was like light out. I'd get up at five. I'd work a fucking 15, 16 hour shift. I'd get out, it was dark. I'd go to bed, I'd get back up, it's still dark. I'd work in the door. Like, I was so focused on saving money and leaving so I could just get a chance to change this. Just get a chance, man. Like, you know, like we talked about, you're not guaranteed anything. Mm -hmm. But I was like willing to really put the time in to see, like, could I really do what I love to do. Could I be a personal trainer, which was a fictitious job yeah. that Richard Simmons had <laughs> fucking yeah, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so, but no, it, the trailer stuff still to this day, like of why I got, it's tattooed right here. So I yeah. see it every day. Yeah. My great grandfather who died in the coal mine explosion in 1935, the, the trailer. And then a uh, Lincoln quote, like every day I look at mm -hmm. it to remind, you know what I mean? It's all around me, dude. So how did you how did you figure out because we're going pre-internet here too? Mm -hmm. So how did you figure out that Columbus State had a program that <laughs> was around exercise training and stuff? Yeah, so totally on accident. I originally was supposed to go to the University of Cincinnati um, with some of my friends, and my like financial aid didn't come through or something just didn't work. And I kept thinking like, how the fuck am I going to pay this money back? Like I didn't even have like you know it's a bigger talk now the debt and all that shit. Yeah. But I was just literally like, we're fucking poor. I'm about to get this money and go to school. And I don't even really know what I'm going to do yet. And a bunch of my homies were, went to Columbus or I'm sorry, went to university of Cincinnati and I stayed home. And that was the year I worked in the coal mine. 
And I said, you know, for the six months, when you, they then wanted to go to Columbus. So they all transferred to Ohio State. And I was like, all right, I saved this money. I'll come up and live with you guys. And I literally just, like, called around, and Columbus State was just starting their one-year exercise special certificate. I was the first class through it 20-some years ago. Shout out to Don Labenthal, who's in my training crew now. He's in, uh, was an amazing, uh, like, mentor for me when I moved here. He saw something in me because I was a fucking train wreck. I'm drinking 40s and Mickey's. I'm smoking Newports on the way to class. Like, I ain't never been away from home. Mm-hmm. And plus, I got my own money because I just done saved 20 grand in the coal mine. So I'm wilding out a little bit. I'm still training and stuff, but, like, I don't look like some promising fucking trainer. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I, but a one year I knew was right for me, and I could pay for it. It was 3000 bucks, And to me, it was like a path. I can live up here and have a college experience. I can go to Columbus State for one year and I can just start my business. And this is like, yeah, like 98, 99 or 99. So. Okay. So that's <clears throat> the question is, what did you do after that? Because at that time, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Because mm-hmm. that's about the same time I actually came to Columbus. Yeah. And so there, the jobs for training were at that time, most of them required. I know the one I ended up with required, you know, a four-year degree yeah. and a CSCS and I think the ACSM certification. So when you come through that, what, what, A, what were you really qualified for? And then where, what did you do? Yeah, so what I realized I was qualified for was to start my own business. Yeah. So I knew I needed more than a weekend seminar, right? Because I had competed in, we talked about it, we'll bring it up, uh, yeah. powerlifting a couple times, hadn't done my first bodybuilding show. I'm 20 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Or 19 years old. And I was qualified enough for Irene that didn't know how to do curls to pay me 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like, you know, I started in uh, on the east side on Bryce Road and in a small uh, tennis and fitness club and they mm-hmm. would let you pay like a couple hundred dollars a month rent. Yeah. And then you could just train clients. Yeah. And literally like I got set up as a, so I was going to school. I was in school about six months at Columbus state and Don said, Hey, there's a guy that I know that's doing really well. His name is Reggie young. You could probably go like fold towels and watch him train people. And so I'm like, all right, cool. And he used to, um, he played at Akron actually football. He was a good athlete, sold fitness. Well, I wanted to do some things different, but it gave me a, like an, a view. Mm-hmm. He's like, he's probably making like six figures. I heard that. Cause I'm in school and they're sitting around going, you know, when you get out of here, you might be able to make 35, 40 mm-hmm. grand. And I'm sitting there going like, that ain't about to change generations of my family. I got to figure something else different than mm-hmm. that. I go there and I see the way he's doing things. Shout out to Reggie. Cause he taught me a lot. But he wasn't real consistent, and I started noticing that. He was missing appointments. I, got, I noticed some intangibles that I knew I would do differently, but he had overflow clients. So I'm 20 years old. He said, look, Irene will pay you 200 bucks for 10 sessions. Do you want her? Sign me up. Yeah. And this is where a lot changed for me, Dave. You know, as a, I was making $14 an hour in a coal mine and then $21 an hour overtime. So I was getting overtime quick, man. I was trying to get the 40 plus hours. I would get that in three shifts, you know what I mean, to get so I could have 40 hours of overtime. Irene handed me that $20, and I knew, I realized she's a 60-year-old nurse. Mm -hmm. She didn't know anything about training. I realized I knew a lot more than her, right? I didn't know more than probably Dave Tate did, but I knew more than Irene did. So to me, I was qualified enough to not hurt her, put her through a good workout, and then somebody just paid me $20, to teach them how to lift weights. Mm-hmm. To me, I was like, okay, that, that's it. And I was like, I need 10 more, 20. Like, once that happened, this thing never stopped, man. And I just started to realize, like, I can really do this. That, that, that really changed everything for me. How did you scale that up then? So what I started doing was I started going to all the little networking meetings around town, the little coffee yeah. things. I started, you know, to bring a friend. Like all the shit you had to do pre-internet, right? right Which, no, yeah, I and, know, and, I know. and I'm thankful I did the same shit. that I had to really <laughs> get and hone my craft in the gym first. So I spent 10 years just personal training. Yeah. But the way that I scaled it was, and this was probably like one of the most important parts of my career, I worked up to where I had about 13 clients over the next like six, seven months or so. And then... They got a new manager in the fitness center and I'm 20 years old at the time. And he comes down to me and he says, look, man, see, you're doing pretty good. We're getting the $200. He's like, next month, we're going to go to start taking 30%. We're changing the system. I said, all right. So I'm just sitting there thinking like, man, fuck you, dude. I'm not about to give you 30%. I'm like, I'm just starting to get really rolling at this point. I'm 20 years old. So he probably just figured I'd roll over. 
So I literally walk out the door that day and I start driving around the area on Bryce Road. I don't know if you ever trained to World's Livingston when you lived mm-hmm. up here, but it was right around the corner from Matt. Because mm-hmm. I used to shut down similar time and then go there and train at lunchtime. And so anyway, so I started looking in on Bryce and Livingston. I find a spot. It's when I say gym, this is a stretch. Yeah. It's a ladder closet for the rehab of the building inside a mini mall on the corner of Livingston's and Bryce Road, and it's 900 square feet. Mm-hmm. And I and I I call the guy and say, hey, will you rent this to me? He's like 600 bucks a month. Blah, blah, blah. I'll fucking take it. He makes me sign a three-year lease. I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. No one's helping me. Mm -hmm. You know, I have $4,000 out on a credit card, a little bit of money left over from, I was blowing some of my money. My buddy gave me a grand, uh, who knows what the fuck he got money at from from campus. Mm -hmm. And I opened this personal training studio at 20 and a half years old. I'm not even 21 yet for five grand. All of my clients. So that was one of the most like cool things of all time. I walk in two weeks later, I get it all set up, and the dude's like, Hey, you know, we're getting ready to switch. I said, like, Bro, I ain't switching to that. I'm taking all my clients. There's no non competes or anything back yeah, then. Yeah. I'll be right down the street a mile. I'm opening up my own fucking gym. The main guy from that place sat me down. And he was an older dude, and I respected him, but he said, This person tried to do that. That person couldn't do it. It was this, that, you know, fucking couldn't be successful. So, bro, ain't none of those people me. Mm-hmm. Ain't none of those people been through what I've been through. Ain't none of those people got to taste what's possible in this. Like, I'm a, I'm different. Like, I'm not going to let this thing fucking fall. I had no, to me, the worst case scenario, I already lived it. Mm-hmm. I was good at coal mining. I liked it. It wasn't, it wasn't like it was a terrible experience. It grew me up, and I loved it, and my whole family did it. So if it didn't work out, I was just going to go back to the fucking coal mine. So to me, like the fallback plan, I already lived the fallback plan long enough, and my whole family had lived it for so many generations that why couldn't I take that fucking chance? I have nothing to lose. Yeah. My dudes on campus are like, "What are you doing, G? They're still in college, mm-hmm. you know." And I, they're like, "You're not going to drink with us on Thursdays no more." They try to have an intervention with me. Yeah, I yeah. said, "Guys, I'm trying to start a business." So here I am at 20, you know, and I was I met my wife at the time. She's my girlfriend. I'll be married 19 years actually this week which is crazy. Congrats. And so she's helping me, you know, paint the walls and get this thing open. So at, you know, at July, I turned 21 in September, like I'm opening my first gym, quote unquote, personal training studio at 20, just figuring it the fuck out. I didn't choose to do it at that time. I was pushed into it, but it changed everything for me. Cause then if I don't go past that fucking spot, dude, I'm already successful. Yeah. I'm doing my job. In my own gym, from only removed from a coal mine 24 months, I'm already fucking winning. Everything after that is a fucking blessing. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's where a lot of people ask about success and money and all this shit. Right there in that fucking moment, I was like, this is what I was pushing for. Now I want it to look different and be bigger yeah. and all that, but like, it was possible. Mm-hmm. That's that's all I was looking for, man. So when you did that, you're now it's not part of a club, right? Mm-hmm. So the sales has to change. Yeah. Right. You have to. I, I assume your referral system has to become way better because yeah, you yeah. can't go out if you have clients that you're sure. training. Yeah. So how did you work your referral system? How do you, how were you able to scale that place? Yep. So for three years, I was in that 900 square feet, or yeah, 900 square feet, and I just kept working the same type of thing. I was in like seven of those little breakfast meetings. Um, I was going to different, I was competing in bodybuilding and powerlifting. So I was networking around that. I started to really take a liking towards nutrition. That's when I met Dr. Serrano. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at 21, 22 years old, I just start showing up at Serrano's office. Literally. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't know me. Um, I was taking ultrasize from Beverly at the time. His name's on the front of the jug. So Mm -hmm. I look him up. There is some internet at that point, right? I'm Mm -hmm. looking him up and I go, this fucking guy's in Pickerington. And I'm, and I'm in Reynoldsburg. So it takes me about three times. Finally, I show up, and he goes, the fuck do you want? And I literally said, I think we should be friends, Eric. Mm-hmm. Like, I want to learn from you. Um, I'm competing. I need help. Like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Like, I just want to learn more of the high-fat dieting, the stuff of Mario Pasquale. Like, I was, like, in it. And so Eric helped me a fucking shitload. And he was just, like, uh, I call him my Puerto Rican dad. He was, like, the guy that I could come to that he knew everybody. He had been around almost everything. He understood supplements, and I could really, like, so his network started to help me a little bit, too. Um, But I think one of the smartest things I did right about that third or fourth year, 
I started promoting drug-free bodybuilding shows. And Eric helped me with the drug testing, actually, to say, like, gee, you got to test this guy, you got to test yeah. this guy. He'd come to the night show and pick the guys I would test. I That right there helped me hang my name up in every gym in Columbus. So what happened was I would promote two shows or three shows a year, but I could hang it up in Worlds. I could hang it up in Lifestyle. I could So I was essentially... No, marketing my personal training in yeah. every fucking gym in the city and no one knew I was doing it. Yeah. But because well, what would happen was people would come to the show and they'd be like, oh, I'll prep for the show with you or you understand how to pose and blah, blah, blah. And so that right there helped me a ton because then I started having people drive to my studio from other places and then I was wholesaling supplements and then it started kind of this process from like 03 to really like 06, 07, where I started really being more well-known for that type of stuff. I'm promoting three, four shows. I compete in powerlifting in the off-season. You know, I'm helping people lose weight, but I'm helping people get ready for stuff. And that's really kind of how my, like, kind of under... I think how my local business started to really grow. When, when you started doing that, was it was it intentional that you knew it would help? Or was it something that you're like, oh, shit, I didn't think about this, now double down? Yeah. I, I figured it out once I started doing it. So I didn't okay. do it on purpose. Yeah. I did it because I couldn't find shows locally that were ran well. And I thought, wait, I could run this business. I can, it'd be another, it'd be twice, three times a year. I get a little bonus, make some cash at the event. But then it's just like a house full of clients coming yeah. in. People that are coming to watch the show are clients. I could sponsor the shows. And I started realizing like, wait, this is like a real opportunity to double down. I did that for about four or five years and that really helped grow everything. Yeah, well that's a huge business lesson right there which is why huge. I jumped on that yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's one thing to do this stuff but you have to do this stuff, you know, and it can fail and it can do, it can it can go well, yeah. it can fail or it can create other opportunities. Uh-huh. You know, and you have to have that entrepreneur awareness yeah. to be able to say, oh shit, this is one different opportunities because it yeah. could become a whole different business too. Well, I can make like, three to five grand a show, which was a lot for me. I'm only making it in personal training, like, you know, maybe 4,000 a month or something like that on a, on a good month in the early days, sometimes 2,000 months, sometimes 10, you know, it'd go mm -hmm. up and down. You lived that. So it's like when I was like, all right, well, I can count on a spring show and a fall show. I get to meet a bunch of new people. Um, I, I'm one of the first people that did the swords and stuff like that because it was lower cost and it was cool trophies. Yeah. Um, you know, I was buying them out of from some dude in North Carolina in like the early 2000s because I think I started running shows like 03. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that was um, – but I really felt like I was growing the sport, same as when I started hosting Power Up the Meets. Like I just really it's, – it's just what I love to do. So I was like how can I just wire myself into it more and more because – Obviously, I, I couldn't really compete on the NPC stage. You know, they were, there were some massive shows here between Mike Francois and Mike Davies' shows. And I was like, man, there's a spot for me, though. Like, I don't live in any one system. Mm -hmm. that, that's the one thing about me. I've always been outside the system. So it's like, not that I haven't been friends with some of the people in the system, but, like, I've always kind of been out here on my own. So I just built a lot of my own companies and shit. And there was people that would, you know, that appreciated it and would take part in it. They were never as big as everything else going on. Mm -hmm. But it was happening, and people were noticing it, and it, and it helped grow everything, for sure. At what point did that spin into Muscle Farm? So in 2000 five or six, I had been selling quite a bit of Beverly uh, Nutrition, Beverly International, and started to really understand supplements. I've been working with Serrano for a few years at this point. I started really dialing the diet, and I got to a point where, you know, Dr. Mario DiPasquale would be emailing me back and forth because I would test things. What I like about Serrano and what he liked about me early was he knew I was super disciplined, and he knew I wasn't taking drugs. So he was like, hey, Let's try this protocol with amino loading. Let's try this protocol with creatine loading. Let's try it with the fats. Like we did a thing one time where I did three days extremely low low carb and then did a fat load where I did like 12,000 fucking calories. And yeah. I swear to you, yeah. I was so veiny and nasty and yeah. dry that guys were coming up to me at World's East and asking me if I started taking stuff. Like, hey, I'm sorry I'm laughing. He yeah, because to, he did the shit to you, I'm sure, too. He tried to have me do that shit. I'm it's like, fucking, I ain't doing that shit. I ate, like, 25 <laughs> eggs, two things of cashews, yeah. all this cheese. So, anyway, so my thing about Serrano, which was good, is I was testing uh, supplement protocols, diet protocols, and I had access to him and Mario Di Pasquale, which is fucking unbelievable, mm -hmm. right? So if I had a question, I could email him, go see Eric, whatever. So then when it came with supplements, I was like, Man, muscle tech, BSN, all that shit was going on. 
I'm like, man, I think there's a there's a spot for an athlete company. There's a spot to support powerlifting, natural bodybuilding. And I started messing around with it in 05, 06, and I couldn't figure it out. I knew that obviously it was going to take some money, the manufacturing. Me and Serrano worked on a protein together, but it just never really came out to anything. And this is uh, kind of a key part of this whole thing. Every year I go to the Arnold, you know, because we live here, obviously. Mm -hmm. I almost evaluate my progress in March from Arnold to Arnold. You know, I've been going since 1999. I sold programs outside because my wife knew somebody that worked uh, mm -hmm. for the Arnold people, and I was a program seller. And um, I get there, and I'm like, try. I'm a 180 or 170 at that time. I'm trying to get fitness modeling. I'm trying to do that kind of shit. So I'm emailing. And, you know, back then, you could go to every fucking magazine had a booth. Mm -hmm. It was different back then. Mm -hmm. I find a magazine I've never heard of before, and it has an ad for a company I've never heard of before. And I just, I'm blindly emailing trying to get sponsorships. I'm really hustling, Dave. And I get a, I get an email back from this random company out of Denver. And they say they'll sponsor me. So I get sponsored for three, four months. And then they just kind of disappear off the map. Boxes quit coming. They're not answering the phone. Something happened with the company. Well, probably like six months later, I get a phone call from the guy that, that ran it, which was my former partner at Muscle Farm. And he said, look, man, um, I really like some of the stuff you were doing. I'm not playing in the NFL anymore. Actually, he was at Kentucky when Windler was there. I think Windler was a strength coach, actually. Um, and so he said, hey, you know, I'm looking for some people to work for me for this new company. And he goes, uh, and he had some other name for it at the time. And I go, look, bro, like, I'm not trying to work for nobody. I've been an entrepreneur now for I mean, this is like in 2008. Yeah. I've been working for myself almost 10 years. Um, at the time, I already started online training with big MLM people. I was already like working on, I started online training like 2006, 2007. So I had clients outside of the US. I had clients and like I was already kind of ahead of that. And I was like, man, my freedom's actually opened up. But if you want a business partner and you really want to attack this, I'm interested. And he said, all right, let me send you the first version of which was our pre-workout, which was called Assault. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Obviously, I have Serrano here, so mm -hmm. I can double check it with him. He sends me a baggie of pre-workout. Now, this is when the one three dimethyl and all that shit was crazy high, right? We didn't we didn't use any of that stuff, but I get it in the mail. I take it at that po at that time. Super Pump two fifty from Gaspari was hot. BSN No Explode, uh, Muscle Text, whatever the fuck it was called. And so I take it. I think it's better than all of them. So I take it to Serrano. I take him the formula. He's like, whoever put this together knows what the fuck they're doing. So, all right, there might be something here, Doc. So I call him, and I basically commit to be his business partner. I've never met the guy in person. I've only had one baggie of pre-workout. You know, his past was a little tattered, but, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fucking believer. If you mm -hmm. got some real shit going on, you can make some mistakes. So I walk downstairs, and I tell my wife, I said, I think I just became business partners with this guy I'd never met before. Then he wants to call this company called, we're going to start this company called Muscle Farm. And he has these. He has some pretty good ideas, and I and I have some have some ideas of what I think I can do. She kind of looked at me like, you, I said, I got this fucking feeling. I don't know. I can't tell you why. I just believe in it. And so then we got together, started coming up with the formulas, the original branding, and and that was in April of 2008. Mm -hmm. And we uh, sold a little bit in 08, but 2009 was the first year where it really started cranking. And I think towards the the end of 09 is when we sponsored. I think Shane Carwin, UFC 96, and that's really what kind of started to get us. When we started messing with the UFC, because it was early mm -hmm. sponsorship days in the UFC, there was a lot of opportunity there. That's when people started really to kind of lock on to us. So was the revenue that you had for that generated through the company, or did it come through the partner? Yeah, so we raised capital multiple different ways, and on top of it, the, every, every dollar that was coming back in was going right into it. Yeah. What's interesting about Muscle Farm is it was lightning in a bottle, dude. It caught fire, as you're aware. Like, yeah, it grew yeah. really fast. We quadrupled, and this is hard to imagine, but it happened every year for like three years. Quadrupled in growth. Yeah. So, like, we did a million in 09, and then go 4 million in 10, and then to like 20 million, and then to like 70. There was never, an, this is my just opinion, never an, enough money and never enough talent. To handle the growth, Dave. It was yeah. it was insane. Yeah. It was an insane amount of growth. And my skill set is not running a warehouse with a million bottles of pre workout in it. Mm -hmm. A thousand percent. And no matter how many gray haired guys we brought in from Campbell's suit, from fucking this like 
you know, we always were bringing in all these guys from all these different big companies. This thing was growing so fucking fast with the way the UFC was growing and, and all the, the stuff that we had that it was like almost virtually impossible to handle it. So sometimes you want that to happen. For us, it was probably what ended up killing us because it was just like it was too much. Yeah. And we kept being aggressive and pushing. I mean, I remember one time we were so hot that vitamin shop called me and I, I was like the liaison with a lot of the big like vendors. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really, I, I didn't really do, do all the number stuff, but I was a relationship guy for sure. Right. So I'm friends with the CEO of GNC and the, the hitters at vitamin shop and Europa and all those. And they're like, dude, you're all over the fucking UFC. People were walking and trying to find the fucking, the bottles and we haven't had product in three months. I'm like, bro, I can't, we're still raising capital to try to produce. We couldn't even fill the orders. Mm -hmm. So it was really like almost the opposite side of what you want. It grew and then it literally exploded. And so it's like when I when I think about muscle farm, it was successful in that it worked, but it was not successful in the fact that it didn't end maybe essentially how I really wanted it to. There was yeah. no big buyout, kind of fell apart towards the end. And it was kind of frustrating. But like the watch something that you had a conversation on the phone with and build like that it, it was it was it was pretty wild experience. well there's a there's a huge difference between gross sales and profit <laughs> yeah. you know so and when you're throwing everything back in was were you guys ever profitable no i didn't we never think made so. money i didn't think no so. and so that's why i tell people like so i have a different view on it right like when you make 170 million but you spend 175 well when you're scaling like that you're you're kind of behind an eight ball the whole time the, the whole time. So one thing that did help me out a little bit is I met later down the road, like the guy that started Zappos. Yeah. Not the one that passed away, but the other guy. And he said, Corey, he goes, before Jeff bought us out, Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. he's like referencing like that. Yeah. He's like, we were $50,000 away from losing the company constantly. Mm -hmm. He said, an unbelievable, he's like, it was a shit storm, like constantly. And I really feel like that's how we were because you know, it's hard to imagine, but when you're getting million dollar orders a week and, and it's in 80 countries and it, it's just uh, it's a wild scalability. I really fell into the role where I was like customer service, content creation, you know, the liaison between the big vendors, all the customers really like locked on to the content. I was heavy on bodybuilding.com and building the stuff with GNC and like I was really intermixed in that. But when it come to the, like the actual like business calls, day to day numbers, you know, we had eight people trying to run the fucking company at that time. That was way outside of my, what I'm really yeah. good at. And so I, I fell into my natural role, which is where I excelled at and where I think I still mm -hmm. excel at. But it's like, yeah, the, it was, um, I, that's why I always tell people. Like it was, a, it was an unbelievable teaching experience and a crazy ride, but frustrating that um, what I thought how it would end. And this is what was really close. A lot of people don't know this. It's like GNC wanted to buy us. I became very, very good friends with the CEO of GNC. We worked together and he called a meeting with me and my partner uh, at a restaurant and said, I want Muscle Farm, Fit Miss, and the Arnold brand to be our house brand and I'm going to buy you guys. And we looked at each other and we're like, holy shit, they had never done that before. Mm -hmm. We fucking did it. We were at that point, you know, multiple walls of GN GNC, doing 30 million there, whatever. And I was like, this is what the fuck. And we needed it. Yeah. Because we needed, we needed, quote unquote, saved. I yeah, mean, yeah, just to yeah. be honest with you. And so he had been the CEO for 12 years, Joe Fortunato, fucking stud. Got in an argument on new moves, not necessarily just us, but just in general with the company. They were, they, he resigned as CEO the next quarter, and they were on my deal. And then, you know, shortly after that, I just didn't like some of the directions, and I knew it wasn't what I started. It was time to do something else. And that's probably one of the hardest things, to get up one day. Some of you poured Every fucking the, the you roll the dice on the wall, the biggest. Yeah. You're willing to go fucking down and try every resource, everything, and then say, This ain't it anymore. And in 2015, that's what I had to do. But mm -hmm. I was I was okay with it because when people say like I gave it all, I risked it all, I did, I rolled the dice, I don't have anything to prove, dude. I mm -hmm. did. You know what I mean? And and I got a chance to live a lot of dreams, push a lot of stuff, learn a lot. Um, but I, you know, I had to lick my wounds and start back over and build these new companies. And I had breakfast with Arnold, like shortly after that, once he had left too, and he sat down, he said, it's all depends on, it's all about how you, how you stand up now. 
He's like, dude, I've had a bunch of stuff not work, you know, how I wanted to over the years. He's been doing business forever. He's like, but what kind of guy are you? You guy that disappears? Mm-hmm. You guy that here's the, you're here to stay. So what's your conversation with him when you sit down? Right. Yeah. You're, you're like laying this out like, hey, man, here's the deal. Well, so because of it, it was publicly traded at the time. There was yeah. a lot of conversations we could have whenever I left. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But after it's all done, I sat down and said, you know, this is the things that I wasn't happy with. This is why I dipped out because he was I was one of the main reasons why he did the deal with us in the first place. And he yeah. shared that with me later. And it was like. Understood, understood business, business. And then he said, so what, you know, how are you going to stand up next? Like, he knows that I was like a real one in the industry. Like, I could handle his likeness. I went through every fucking take of Pumping Iron, Dave. I'm one of the only people, mm-hmm. I think, like five people maybe out there yeah. that's seen every take. Like, he trusted me with his likeness and the marketing and all the shit, all the interviews and all the shit we did. Like, the content absolutely fucking murdered it. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I studied most of the 70s shit, so I was like, I was lived then, even though I didn't. Um, but yeah, everything with him has always been family first, training, business. Arnold will always asked me, because he's a big family guy. He always likes to know like if I'm in shape and what I'm doing. Um, when he introduced me to Betty Weeder, he said, Betty, feel feel Corey's abs. And and he likes to squat almost every day. Like we used to not even like squatting. Like mm-hmm. he's just like the training, he's dude, he's just like us. Yeah. He just happened to do all that other shit on top of it. So like I'm very like with Arnold, it was always so training heavy. I think I really reminded him or brought that like nostalgic stuff back because I I was in it so so, so deep yeah. like that that our conversations um like i said still to this day pre-covid every year for christmas i'm there smoking cigars at his yeah. house like we've continued that friendship when you say that there's you know there's things that you wouldn't do again yeah. right so now you have max effort muscle what are some of those things that you won't do yeah. again it's a great question so i always thought that um when i saw what happened at bodybuilding.com with my content you know i was one of the first video trainers on bodybuilding.com meaning like I had the Get Swole Trainer, which no one was supersetting at that time. So I had like a really basic bodybuilding, little bit of parallel thing, superset thing. Then I go and do the Blueprint with Arnold, which was two phases that murdered it. And then I come out with the Squat Every Day stuff, which once again crushed it. I had like a couple hundred million page views between all of those. Mm -hmm. So I'm having people all over the world, like thousands and thousands of people all over the world doing this stuff. So I realized and I saw the sales that were directly from bodybuilding.com to these people. Mm -hmm. from me, 100%. Like, they're following the program, they're following the stack, they're getting results, they're coming back, they're telling their friends. And I thought to myself, I'm not dealing with all these retailers anymore. And this is before retail wasn't cool anymore. I just knew for me, yeah, like, I'm an organic, like, grassroots, in the fucking gym, I live it every day, I love it, I breathe it. That's what I want to do, man. So I was like, when I'm done with this, I want to start a training app, which I didn't want to go on someone else's app, I wanted to build my own, I wanted to have my own app and I wanted to fucking have my direct to customer domestic supplement brand and go return it back to the Beverly International feel, the early stage MP, you know, just get back to the grassroots. And so since I had a non-compete for about a year, so in 16, we restart max, uh, start max effort, obviously maximum efforts where it came from. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it was actually available. Uh, Amazing enough. (laughs) Um, And I start the training app and a lot of people from the bodybuilding.com days had come over and my life has been completely different since then. Um, it's like always rooted in training first from 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning, Monday through Friday. I got a crew called the 4 a.m. crew of like, drug-free power lifters that are making some good headway right now. I got a lot of strong guys. We're capturing content. We're putting it on the app. Training. There's 99 months day one of my training program on the app. Mm-hmm. I've been putting it on every month of what we do in that crew since 2015 when I got on there. Like, is it, okay, is it safe to say that you 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 kind of grew up with training changing your life, right? No question. And that and that even through that, it's you with your own training. Actually, your grandpa with you, and then yep. your own training, and then you with the clients. Yep. And then it goes into Muscle Farm, and then that becomes disconnected. Where the only real personal relationship you might have would be trade shows. Yeah, for sure. Guest appearances and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. So. Yep. While while that's you know growing at this alarming rate, you're seeing what you really love yes. decreasing at that same alarming rate because it's becoming more retail oriented. You know, yeah, yeah. You're, you're, the people Big that you're box. yeah, I'm gonna go on a limb here and mm-hmm. say the people that you're you're dealing with on the retail end, 
at the higher levels probably don't even fucking train. No. Right? Dude, that was the... I always... Yeah, no, not at all. They so have not, no fucking yeah. clue what they're even talking... They don't even understand... I was like early on content marketing too. Yeah. They didn't even understand the value. I'm sitting in these rooms. I'm like, I don't think you guys understand. Like there's fucking 25,000 people doing this workout and we're selling like $20 million in product because of it. Like you're not getting what I'm, yeah. you know, they just didn't even, well, you're just tweeting and working out. What they didn't realize is that for probably four or five years, I was putting out a workout of the day every day consistently. People were sharing them and liking it. And like, the amount of free content, Dave, I put out without zero expectation, just hoping they would give me a try. It, it built the when I look all the way down of what I really did well, is I'm a pro I program. That mm -hmm. that's what I do. I was in my gym for 10 years. Every day, I'd write down the program, like overall program for the day. And once I was done with it, I'd throw it in a box. You know what those those workouts that were on fucking Facebook before having had graphics? Yeah. They were the workouts from that fucking box. From the next 10 years, I put them online. Then when they came to me and said, you, uh, you know, and I saw how it was starting to affect people because I was being consistent with it and they were giving me feedback and they're like, do you think you could do it on camera? I'm like, motherfucker, set, turn the fucking thing on. Mm -hmm. I'm ready for this. I've been doing this for 15 years. As soon as Bodybuilding.com gave me that opportunity, 28 million page views on Get Swole right out the gate. Fucking like 60 million page views with the fucking blueprint. Another fucking 40 million with Squat Every Day. I had locked in thousands of people into these training things that's why like the stuff i learned at west side the stuff i learned off arnold like i was able to take pieces of all these things and intermix it and get it out to all of these people mm -hmm. to try and you know i would say a lot of it was like higher end gen pop they're people that don't want to maybe compete like you or i but don't want to be like everyone else either so it's like a, it's a demo where they want to push but they might never step on the platform mm -hmm. or the stage and so uh, that really was my, I guess, my main kind of area of where I excelled at because I'm an everyday dude, man. I'm not that big. I'm not that gifted. I'm a fucking hardworking guy that believes in myself, that wants to push, that wants to still have the butterflies, that still has the fucking call time in the team at 4 a.m., that still has the fucking meet days, that still has the days where you got to show up. Like, And so I've just continued to put myself on that type of like cycle Literally since I've been 20 years old, I've competed in it fucking every year, multiple times, every year still to this day. Yeah. And it's like, and people just followed along because they could, they could root for me and jump on the same stuff I'm doing. So how frustrating is it with you when you're sitting in these corporate meetings, right? And you're trying to explain this and <laughs> yeah. you're trying to explain the reach. And at the same time, they're probably still seeing you as, you know, the, the stupid muscle head. Exactly. You know, as, as the outlier, but you're sitting there representing a multi-million dollar brand. Yeah. Um, it, it how tough. frustrating is that? Super frustrating. And I would say it's probably one of the biggest drives of why I'm trying to showcase what I'm what I what I really yeah. know. How so, did you process it at the time, though? Uh, I mean, because you're sitting there and you're trying to be productive during this meeting. But at the same time, you got to be sitting there like, fucker, you know, I realized that my worth was an intangible they didn't understand. Yeah. And that I probably was never going to get the understanding of my value that I would have to keep, you know, producing and be and do things that they didn't think was possible. Like, Hey, we're struggling at GNC. All right, cool. I'll go make, you know, I'll go literally make friends with the CEO and figure it out. Yeah. They're like, Oh, that's your project. And then when I did it and it grew from 3 million to 30 and when I'm walking in the trade show, the CEO is not coming over to anyone else. He's coming over to me. We're still friends to this day. Like I have intangible relationship building skills because I'm a fucking real guy. And yeah. when people get around me, they get that. Like, it's actually, like, I really, would, like, I got to him and I said, dude, we suck here. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And we're from the same area. Like, you know, we had some common things. And he was like, all right, yeah, we'll help you. So it's like, I just have went on this path of doing things that aren't really in the textbook. Mm -hmm. And I think that people just have a hard time identifying with it. And, dude, I've been through so much shit. Like, I've built this confidence and belief in myself through all of this work and ups and downs and wins and losses. And so like, it's not fucking fake. And it, and it honestly, it puts a lot of people off. I don't feel like I come off like a cocky person, but I believe in myself because I've been fucking working on it every fucking day forever. So it's like sometimes in these meetings, like if you ain't taking care of yourself, you're already feeling one way about me. Then you got a fucking Cornell degree, but you can't hold my jock in a fucking business meeting. You already feel a way about me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, 
what am I supposed to fucking do? And so, it, you know, they would press on me. And I think when I was younger, I wasn't the person that would pipe up. I might have sat back too much because I would, those things would still like intimidate me a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I realized that, yo, I, I didn't get here by accident. This isn't fucking no one sprinkled no fucking pixie dust on me and I got here. Like I worked for this and I went through some crazy shit. And like, so I, I'm a hitter too. And I just needed to make sure, like, remind myself after that thing that that's not going to be me anymore. Yeah. That if I, if that, if this, these companies grow like that, it's a different situation. And, and honestly, like, now I would know exactly what to do. I mean, I think that's how, how it works, right? What would you do? I think that I would slow the reins on purpose. I'd say no more than yes. No, we're not going in that. We're not, we're not, we're not taking those stores. We're not taking this money. We're going to wait. We're going to build a better profit margin. We're going to take our time. How well received do you think that really would have went though? Terrible because, <laughs> yeah, because you know what? At the end of the day, you think it's just like a, like a pro athlete. They think the check's never going to stop. Mm-hmm. It's a similar thing. You think the sales. So when you're a top line company, people want to talk about the top line. But when all of a sudden. Really? Th- yeah, right? But when the top line stops, they're like, oh, where's the bottom line? So it's like, you know what I'm saying? Like, wow. it's one of those things, like the top line, top line, top line. Can you be a half a billion? Can you be 250 million? Can you be three? It's like, so they now just that's a little fucked up, right? Because now that you're a smaller brand, yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess your biggest concern is the bottom line. Of course, yes. Because that's, that's how, you, how you make money. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you go in business to make money. Yeah. And that's my point. So like, I feel like I could stand on any fucking business stage and say, I've lived both worlds. Yeah. 60,000 fucking doors, 80 countries, UFC, Arnold, Tiger, fucking you name, Mike Vick, all of the heaviest fucking hitters and did all of that wild shit. Direct to customer brand, app, content team, full team, in-house, everything. This is a more successful business. Yeah. Now, what are some of the things that you took from Muscle Farmer to put into Max Effort? Then we'll get into training. Yeah. So I think like, one thing was a lot of the supplements were really, really good, but they need tweaked, right? So I could go to a new manufacturer, a new science team, obviously called Eric from time to time, mm-hmm. and really dial in taste, mixability, and even just like application a little bit more. Take my time. I wasn't in a rush. So like, you know, in the back in the day, we'd be so fucking busy that like we have to get a new flavor out the door. Maybe it needed two more times or whatever. Sometimes I wasn't even in those meetings anymore because we were so fucking big. Mm-hmm. You'll, I brought you some stuff. You'll know when you taste it. Everything's fucking A plus, man. Yeah. Because if it don't taste good and don't mix good and has a quality, people are going to fucking use it. Mm-hmm. So I just, the brand, the supplements, I spent so much time on every fucking skew, every fucking flavor. And because I still live this every fucking day. Supplements are really important to me, Dave, because I've never took drugs. I have to fucking have my supplements and my nutrition dead on to even squeeze every ounce out of this body I got because I got nothing else extra on top of that. So the supplements, the creatine, like everything. So like I'm so dialed into the formulas because I've competed on all of it. You know, we just did, uh, it was in July or April, I did a bodybuilding show in Akron. And the next day I went down to uh, Empower, uh, where Larry works, Larry Pacific goes at, and did a fucking powerlifting meet the, the next day. Mm-hmm. I weighed in at fucking 181 uh, for the powerlifting meet, you know, 24-hour weigh-in. Drove straight to fucking Akron, jumped on stage, competed in a bodybuilding show, started bloating about halfway through it, went the next day down to fucking uh, the show at Empower, and squatted 694.4 at 181. Multiply, master. Like, you know, total like 1543, which isn't anything crazy, but, you know, I had Joe Bayless send me all the AAPF, like, elite things. 1542 is what it said what Tested Elite was. So I wanted to fucking do a body on the show and the next day do that. So, like, if my supplements aren't dead on, my sleep's not dead on, like, I do do my blood panels. My, mm-hmm. my testosterone's like 400. It's nothing crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm opti- but I'm but I'm getting and squeezing the most out of a 44-year-old athlete that I can. And it's really because of that. So when I'm putting stuff out, it's shit that I'm using. It's stuff that I know works. And I'm, and I'm trying to showcase the application. So, like, the things that we did, like, it's just not big box type stuff. Yeah. It's fucking, you know, that's why that's why I'm so passionate about it, man. It's grassroots. It's real. It's growing. It's fun. At the same time, though, with, you, with your patients and, and business, especially smaller business, speed matters. Yeah. Right? So is it that certain things, for those that are listening that are entrepreneurs, certain mm-hmm. things, speed matters yeah. a lot. And yeah, then yeah. other things... 
it doesn't it, it matters but not as much yeah i would say as more corporate the other business got we got slow yes. and now the agility with the team is fast yeah we turn quality and fast so i learned that quality content great people fast also, I but not my, perfect. And not perfect. No, no, nothing. Yeah, well, no, I perfect. get that, but yeah. some people get wrapped up in uh, perfect, so then they get slow. Well, yeah, and I'll, and I'll beat that person probably almost every day of the week. Yeah. Because you're waiting and I'm not. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's the thing is, like, what I told the guys that work with me is, like, I wear motherfuckers out, too. Like, we've got to work, flip stuff, be able to move, be agile. Like, you know, and, I, and honestly, I, I wouldn't sign back up, like, for this company to be like that company. Like, I don't want no part of that shit anymore. Like, I love the way that we operate. I love the grassroots. It's based, dude, at the end of the day, it's based around the gym. Mm -hmm. If the gym is not there, if old school gym is not there, I mean, it's been around since 03, 04. Like, if it's not there, nothing else is there. If I'm not training with my crew and I'm in there early, none of this other shit works. So, like, the backdrop is the fucking training. The reason why I get up at 3.20 a.m., I'm in the fucking gym at 4, I'm competing against this guys, these guys every day still. I'm not winning very often anymore, but I'm still in there fucking getting it, and I've been getting healthy enough, so I'm, I'm excited about training like lately, and it's like, you know, then I go to supplements and content. Like, people don't, a lot of people, I think, because of the business success, think I'm the opposite way. I've never been a business first guy. It's always been fucking weights. Mm -hmm. And when people start to realize, like, I give a fuck about if my deadlift's going up or not. Mm -hmm. Way more than probably people realize. Like, I feel like I still have stuff to prove that way. That's why I'm still after it. I try business wise, bro, like I built four seven figure businesses from scratch. Like, I'm fucking pretty proud of those things coming from where I came from, right? Now if I can go squat six hundred raw, if I can pull six hundred like yeah, yeah. I, I've got, you know, I've got bigger maybe goals essentially in the gym sometimes than maybe in, in in business. I just happened to study them both at the same time and, you know, had some good success. But it's like I need people to understand that Corey Gregory's a fucking weightlifter. This is the fourth generation of my family that did this. Yeah. The business just happened. I happened to have a knack for it and, and I adapted well with social media, as did you. Mm -hmm. Content creation, social media, and I like it because it's impactful. And so I think sometimes that gets a little bit mixed up. Well, it's the reason why you originally were training at 4 a.m. Yep. You know, it's not just a catchphrase and all no. the other stuff. It, it happened first, then you make it marketable second. Yeah, yeah. It where, happened out of necessity. Yes. Dad, business owner, still want to compete. That shouldn't happen at 7 a.m. or 5 p.m. <laughs> yeah. And, and why? I mean, yeah. ex why? Because... Well, because I want to be done at work so I can go to my kids' stuff and take them to practice. Mm -hmm. I want to be present as a dad, which my dad was not. So that's another cycle I'm trying to break. I want to make sure that my phone is not fucking... Ring my phone starts ringing 7, 8 o'clock. You can't fucking train during that if you're running multi-million dollar businesses. Mm -hmm. So people think it's like cute and I'm like trying to rep the fucking 4 a.m. I'm at 4 a.m. out of necessity. My phone is not fucking ringing. All of my family's asleep, and I can be Corey in the fucking gym, which, by the way, is what drives everything else. Yes. So it's like that. Like I don't like kind of get out of bed. I don't kind of want this shit. I fucking want it. I'm excited to get up to do something I love to do every day. Like that. I don't have like an emotional decision on whether I go to the gym or not. Like this is not like a. This is not my fucking hobby. You know what I mean? This yeah, is what I do. Yeah. It's what you do. And yeah. so it's like there's a different kind of a thing that's like that's why people that try to fuck with the 4 a.m. stuff that want to come train with us and they want to have half their foot in the bar and half their foot in training like it don't fucking work, man. Like it weeds motherfuckers out real easy. Yeah. Because of the call time. What, what I saw going through your stuff, because people either love or hate you. Right. They do. They do. Up, I right? knew right? you knew that. <laughs> yeah. And so as I'm going through your stuff, you know, it's. I go through everybody's stuff before a podcast, sure. you know, with a blank slate, trying to figure out, like, why? Like, what's going on oh, here, right? I appreciate that, by yeah, the way. Yeah, and, um, well, it's, it's like my job, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And, and with that, it's all these things, like the, the, the 4 a.m., you know, that, that was out of necessity, which is why I brought mm -hmm. that up, because yep. when else are you going to do that? You know, no other time. I have the same fucking thing. I, for me, it just it ended up being different because mm -hmm. I sell gym equipment, and the best time I was able to get a hold of personal trainers was at night. Got it. After they closed the gym. And they're at home and they're, you know, online or whatever it's sure. going to be. You can't get a hold of any of these motherfuckers while they're training athletes all yeah, day yeah. long. You know, when you were training your clients all day yeah. long. And for me at the very beginning, those were my best customers. Like, well, sure. fuck, how do I get in front of my best customer? I can't, like, show up yeah, yeah, in the yeah, middle yeah. of your training session. You're making True. money. 
You know, so it's either super early or oh, it's going to be super late. Super early ain't going to work because most motherfuckers aren't up. Yeah. But sure. they're all up. Yep. Late, you know, so it's my work hours still extending like 2 a.m. Crazy yeah, shit yeah. like that. So it, it's out in the – so when people – I'm on the other end. They're like, I mean, I can't believe Dave. He works all the fucking time. He's working all night. It's like, That's dude, this motherfucker, this is how it started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and it's now just this habit that is what it is. But with all these things I was looking at through you, the 4 a.m., it's like, okay, get it. You know, the – the um, squat every day like mm -hmm. oh i see so he experimented he fucked with this it started to work for him real well then he's like oh light bulb i'm gonna market this motherfucker because yep. it's got marketing potential for sure and the the lunging yep. the same thing it's like yep. okay this works hey i can market this motherfucker yep. people are looking at you the ones the haters whatever you want to call and they're seeing the mark they think the marketing came before the application yeah and they're missing the whole boat Thanks, right. One, one of it is, I mean, they're completely, a lot of fuckers do that. Oh, I right? know. But that, that's huge, right? It's because huge. it shows two skill sets. Mm -hmm. It shows the figuring shit out in the gym skill set. Which, which I we're love. Which we're talking about next. Yeah. But then also the, the entrepreneur skill, ship, or skill set to be able to say, there's something here. For sure. You know, I can leverage this, you know, as a business and the people who suck at business should pay attention <laughs> and shut up because they, they may have their own thing. I guarantee they do. Yeah. They all have their own things that sure. they probably could leverage, but they don't because they're too stupid to be able to know, hey, there's something different. Or too scared to be different. Yeah, I mean, the different things are what you want to market. Yeah. Who wants well, to hear the same shit? And whenever I started figuring out the lunch shit like 10 years ago... I had real bad patella tendonitis and I couldn't fucking, I was having a hard time squatting and like running was hurting. I literally just went to the fucking track and was like, I'm going to lunge uh, one time around and just see what the fuck happens. Why though? I mean, why, why do you think lunge? Like out of uh, all the shit you I, could do. Because it was like, at that time I was getting ready for a bodybuilding show and I was like, what will make my legs look, you know, nasty um, that I can't squat? And I couldn't do sissy squats. I couldn't do any of the uh, bodybuilding shit. Yeah. And I was like, can I lunge? And I went, you know, very knee behind toe, whatever. And I was like, all right, I can do this. So I was like, let me just do a fucking shitload of volume, you know, back to the 70s yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I lunge around. I was embarrassed how sore I was. It was like 10 days. And I was like, but then what? But on day three, though, I felt different, meaning like metabolically. I don't know. It like fucking surged something. So then I was like, what happens if I start stringing some of these days together? So then once I, my soreness kind of left, I started stringing two or three days a week. Then I just started getting, and this is how my brain works. I train at the gym, stop by the track. I don't like fucking running and doing regular walk on a treadmill yeah, fucking yeah, 45 yeah, minutes. Yeah. I like doing that shit anyway. So I was like, I just started going lunging 400 meters. And then I did 800 one day. And I felt a whole different ball game. So my metabolic rate within a week of like 800 or two weeks of 800 meters every day after lifting weights, dude, I started getting fucking lean. And I went to a trade show for bodybuilding.com and I wasn't really trying to really even get ready for anything. A couple of guys were like, do you getting ready for something? Like got a shoot or something coming up? I'm like, nah, why? I'm like, bro, you're looking fucking diced up. I was like 185, pretty bricked up. I'm like, but I just remember like I wasn't eating like as, as close as I had for shows and stuff like that. But whatever was happening in the lunch show is like somewhere in between steady state cardio, lifting weights and sprinting. I, and that's the best way I can explain it because I don't understand the energy systems and shit like that. I, I'm not an academic dude. I just knew. And then I got to where I was wearing a 40-pound vest. Then I would rock an 80-pound vest sometimes. Now, I couldn't lift heavy when I was doing that shit. This was more yeah, for yeah. conditioning. But I started to figure out this is what happened. I had done like, I think I did 13 covers of magazines, which was one of my major goals when I first moved here was I want to be on the cover of fucking magazines and I want to own my gym. I own a gym. That was my two main goals. I thought if I did that, I would be world famous mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I was like, but I'd go to these photo shoots for Fitness RX or, you know, men's fitness or whatever it was, and I'd be so fucking weak. And that was still important to me, which a lot of people don't understand, but it was, even if I was only squatting 405 or something at the time. But when I was lunging and getting in shape, I wasn't weak. And so that's what started to bridge the gap between when I would get dialed in, I was still fucking strong. And I think it's because my conditioning or GPP was based around all lunging work. So I would do sled work and lunges, but mostly lift weights, high volume, go lunge 800 meters. My result just was completely different. Metabolism was faster than when I was a kid. My fullness of my muscle was there. And I was still able to compete in powerlifting relatively fast turnaround. And so to me, and no one else was doing it. 
So there's where that came in. Like, hey, you can do this anywhere. You don't need a fucking treadmill. You don't need this application. Everyone knows how to do lunges. But fucking double down on it. So I started programming it. Then I started seeing the results from the community. Then it became a thing. Now it's lunge and learn, which this is the real part I really like, Dave, is that the amount of books in the last decade in podcasts that I've went through because I pop on something that sharpens my mind while I'm lunging 20 or 30 minutes and it made a huge difference in my business career too. I was studying every morning while I was doing my conditioning and a decade later, the amount of books I've read, the amount of podcasts I listen to, it's staggering. Like right now, I'm on a streak of 391 days up my hill, which is about 600 meters um, up a, a gradual grade. So train from four to 5.30, quarter to six, come right home to my house, throw on a podcast or a book, lunge up my hill every day. You know, and the only reason with, I miss is if I'm banged up or hurt or something. With the content that you're absorbing, because I absorb a tremendous amount of content, and, you know, I'll admit over the last couple of years that content shifted into more new shit, which yeah. I've, I have shifted the fuck off of that six months ago because it ended up being a waste of 18 months okay. of time that I should have been, you know, working on the business content and stuff sure. like that. So this content that you're talking about, is it so, uh, personal development content? Yeah. Or is it leisure content? No, 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 never leisure. Yeah. Always personal development, always marketing, business, training content, um, things that are going to make me smarter because I don't have a traditional education. You know, I never read any books in high school. I barely made it through Columbus State in one year. And the reality is, is that I've learned more in that time frame in books of, you know, business and real estate and I'm self-taught and dividend investing, all of that stuff. Like I wanted to... <laughs> lift weights, work a job I liked, and then create wealth for my family. And no one was going to fucking teach it to me. I had to teach it to my damn self. And so I started really locking on to all those things. And something weird about the way my brain works, and I figured this out when I was traveling for MP, is if something, if there's music going on while I was reading, I could retain the information. But as a kid, I couldn't retain it. So I must have some type of learning thing or something. But like, if I just read right now, I'm not going to remember it. But as soon as I had some like soul music on, I would catch it on a plane. I just did it on accident one day. And I was like, wait a second. I, re I like retain that information. Same thing with lunging. It almost puts me in like that runner's high type of euphoric thing. As soon as I start lunging, I'm in a few minutes, whatever's sinking into my brain, man, it's just going right in. And so I've had my best like content sessions after that, came up with great business ideas, um, it's, it's a time I'm real protective of. I don't do it. Usually there's no one else that's there with me. Um, and it's, and it's been real important to my development as a person, as a dad, as a, as a husband, all of it, bro. Well, I think the big takeaway is there, you know, you, you've been a part of an $80 million brand, part of, you know, smaller brands, you know, four different companies that you said, and even just the personal training space, you could be like so many others and say, I don't need to listen to this crap. Right. Yeah. And to be honest with people, too, a lot of the stuff that you listen to and I probably listen to, we already know. Yeah, yeah. It's just repetitive. And a lot of times you just turn it off like, okay, bend down this road yeah, and you yeah. go to a different one. But it will remind you. You need reminded. You know, of things that you forgot about. And just like in training that I've learned is the, the more advanced somebody comes, the more skilled, the more experienced they become, where they start to fall short in training yep. and in business is the basics. For sure. Because you become so detail oriented, mm -hmm. like is the upper back weak? Is the grip? What's yeah, this, yeah. what this? And then all of a sudden it's like fuck the bars. I, I grab the bar uneven. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's My like toes turned out a little yeah, bit. Yeah, the, <laughs> the real simple shit. You know, just kind of falls away. I think it's out of sight, out of mind. I think people get out of the habit and they start to forget the basic stuff. And I need reminded that, you know, the consistent things I'm doing on a regular basis, and that if I'm like down a road, I need to sharpen up this or that, or whether it's marketing, whether it's email marketing, like I, I'll just pick little topics and then, yeah. and, re, and, and I listen to a lot of the same content often, but I think it's just keeping it, it like in the forefront of your mind. Cause people think personal development's hokey and that's cool, but I'm trying to fucking get like, get sharper and smarter. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that, that's not going to happen on accident. Like I have to be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. With, I'm really, really big with the, on the training side of people learning how to figure shit out for themselves. I call yeah. it auto regulation, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, it takes it years, you know, for, for people sure. to figure this shit out. So as we jump topics here and we go into the training, you have your own training philosophy that's evolved over 25 years. For sure. What would you say is the base 
yep. of that philosophy because we tapped lunges and we, but all these fit in. Yeah, you yeah. know, they're just they're there's they're spokes of the of the wheel. Like, sure. what's the hub? This is where people love me too. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's fine. So I think that it what what's interesting, and I think people got to understand this: the resources were so low that early, all I had access to was '70s bodybuilding, which is a pretty good thing to have access to, right? Um, and then like we talked about, and I think it's a good time to bring up this story is like, I start powerlifting in 1997 in high school, my senior year, I do a bench meet. I graduate and I'm a member of this gym called the fitness pavilion, which is in a trailer park, which Louie called the trailer park nationals. Mm -hmm. So in 98, I signed up for a powerlifting meet my first time ever in, uh, I don't know what ply it was, but some guy gave me a fucking bench shirt mm -hmm. and I think I'm going to go bench, you know, 350 or something, whatever. Well, I end up almost bombing out and make 250, but that day, as a 18-year-old kid, I witnessed Westside Barbell for the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I'm in this trailer park. Literally, I couldn't make this up. No, the it's a trailer park. The gym is in a fucking trailer park. It's a trailer park. <laughs> and what's funny is, Dave, is you'll love this. There's, you know, I mean, fuck, I didn't have any money then, bro. Mm -hmm. I, I stole 245s. I feel bad saying this. The two twenty fives are still in my gym today from that fucking trailer park gym. Mm -hmm. Like so, when we're loading plates sometimes, like on squat or deadlift, and I see some. Of so these you plates, trained in that gym? That was my home gym. Oh my god! <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Oh my god! So, so like one day I pull up, and it was a key card before that was even a thing, and I'm like, I really need some forty five for. It wasn't yeah, even yeah, my. Yeah, I, yeah, I lived yeah, in a yeah. trailer. It was my neighbor's basement. Yeah. I'm like, wasn't the owner paying for college? He had I, he ran the meets to be able to pay for college. That and there was this other guy that I think he used to come up and train at Westside yeah. sometimes. Uh, sometimes too, he's a five hundred pound bencher. I don't know. It, yeah, yeah. He, the stories are no. I yeah, yeah. yeah. So anyway, so I signed up for that meet, and here I am, nineteen ninety eight, my second meet, whatever, and all of these fucking monsters roll in, denim shirts. I'm pretty sure Louie brought his own fucking bar. Like, mm -hmm. I'm I'm just like, I don't know what the fuck I'm watching. Because I'm not reading Powerlifting USA this yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. There's no internet. And I watch, you know, Louie bench 600 on his 50th birthday. Yeah. He jumps into someone's arms. Like, he can't even move yeah. his arms. He's got the denim shirt on. Yeah. And I'm watching, but I'm paying attention to the intensity, the amount of weights that are being lifted. I'm already in a fucking hardcore gym, right, that I, I fucking love it. And I was hooked on the meat that day that this was something I could do for the rest of my life. That sports were over, but this was my new sport. This and probably bodybuilding. And it was like, what I witnessed, it hooked me, but then then rehooked me till like 10 years later. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really realize what I was watching as a high, basically right That's out That's interesting, man, because on the, on the other side of that, I was the one that lifted off to Louis that day. So fucking crazy. Right? <laughs> So, our, our yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's and I, when I lit, he always had a soft line, you know, he, he yeah. would just straight down to his chest. So, I lifted off, and it's like, fuck, it's on his chest. He just dropped it quick. Just yeah. Fucking, yeah, I always did that. Then he pressed it back up, and it's like, we're like, fuck, did he get this? You know, it's, you, you, it's one of those where you, you don't want to look at the lights. You're yeah, like looking yeah. over here, and you're like, fuck, I don't want to. And then, you know, it was like, okay, he got it, you know, but it was one of those things like, I never want to lift off to you again. This was fucking <laughs> horrid because you don't know when to let go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I should, it's, it, but yeah, he, he bent 600 that day and there was a little fucking, there was like where the bench was and then there's this little room. Little room, yeah, yeah. This fucking little room that just had like nothing in it. It just, yeah, it was a trailer park national. Yeah, <laughs> and so when I met Louie like in yeah. 08 and I brought it up, Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, yeah, Trailer Park Nationals. I remember that meet. It yeah. wasn't a fucking trailer park. <laughs> no, it was. It, it was. It was a trailer park. So that was, like, kind of my first experience of, like, watching, like, real intensity. Yeah. And I had already, you know, it was my second competition. And then I really don't pick power. I do, like, some NASA meets here and there. But I really got more into bodybuilding. So I kind of stayed with, like, the 70s stuff till about probably 2006 or seven, um, is when I started, like, printing off the articles from Louie's website. I started understanding kind of what, obviously I was in Columbus, but I didn't move here because I thought the Arnold Classic was here. I didn't move here because I knew Westside Barbo was here. I moved here because my friends were going to fucking mm -hmm. Ohio State and I thought I could go to Columbus State. And so what I started to realize is like, there's some serious fucking resources here. Mm -hmm. I'm building a good business for myself. And if I really want to do powerlifting, I need to study the godfather of it's literally right up the fucking street. So obviously I knew I couldn't just walk in there, but I was like, I need to study. I need to start to understand. And I started to become really like just infatuated with watching the videos online, you know, seeing the box squats and, and really just went down the rabbit hole, which is the content you've been putting out forever, Dave, is just to figure out like, I want to be fucking stronger, but I want to do both. 
And that was my thing from day one. I always want to still compete because from a marketing standpoint, abs sell. It's just what what Mm -hmm. it is. And I still had an affection towards that 70s kind of Frank Zane type of thing. I wanted to look like that. But, man, I just fucking love lifting heavy weights. And I could not deny it. So I would flip back and forth. And I'd go up my off-season up to, like, 220, flip back down to 170. But then when I started lunging and doing some other stuff, I started to kind of close that gap. I was able to stay leaner as I got heavier. And then I was able to compete a little uh, compete a little heavier too. And then I just went on this streak of covers, training uh, for powerlifting. And then about 2000, I'll say, let's see, 2011, that's the first time I squatted 700. 2010, that's when Tim Harold walked in my gym. And so I walked in. I just got done doing a photo shoot. I was like 170 pounds, and Big Tim Harold from West Side is like 450 pounds, six foot seven. I said, Tim, um, after I met him, I said, you know, he's gonna train in my gym like on the off days. I'm like, I really want to learn West Side. I, I want to learn conjugate. I want to understand it. Like I don't fucking understand it. I'm looking at this magazine that was in Flex, like where they kind of explained it. And like in 2010, had Ramos there fucking pulling yeah. and and all those guys, and I was like, I, I need to learn this if I want to be a better trainer. I have to understand this. That that was my pool was um, I understood a lot of the bodybuilding stuff. I did not understand what real powerlifting was. I was playing powerlifter. Some people might still think that, but I, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but the reality is is that I really wanted to learn and I wanted to experience it. And because of the things I had been through in the past, I've been around some fucking grimy ass motherfuckers underground and guys I've been around in that gym. I really wasn't scared of it. I just needed to get around it. And Tim then introduced me to Zach Cole and we trained for a while and then finally, Joe Bayless kind of showed up, Travis and Sean Henderson, a couple of these other guys that was going on Friday nights. Tim looked at me. I think I squatted 600 in a, in a single ply. I was probably like 220. I wasn't that strong. He goes, I'll start going on Friday nights. I'll take you up there and we'll, we'll you know, squat. And I was like, all right. Obviously, I was nervous. So he's like, don't make me fucking look bad. You know, Tim doesn't say very much. Yeah. So I get up there and Gritter's there fucking running the monolift. And, dude, I had the band set up wrong in my gym before, because I had been squatting. Tim wasn't there on squat day, so a lot of shit I was setting up myself. We were squatting in front of a mirror. Amazing. Bands were not choked right, so I didn't have the right tensions. Um, The box was lower than we were squatting to. I was a fucking train wreck. It was a blue band. It was, you know, the fucking things choked this wide. I unracked the bar, got my single ply on, and I'm thinking to myself, I am fucked. But, and then I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm all disoriented, you know, but I'm trying not to make Tim look bad. And they're just jumping plates. There's no fucking change, yeah. right? So I go, bar, plate, second plate, make double. Gritter starts yelling at me. Who the fuck let this motherfucker, this is the worst fuck, what is the worst fucking squats I ever fucking seen? Like he's fucking yelling every, after every fucking set. So then I go. <laughs> And then on three plates plus a blue, I unrack it and he's yelling, hold, hold. And my fucking lower back, Dave, is just, mm-hmm. you know, he's hazing the fuck out of me, which is whatever. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm not going to fucking break. I'm going to, so I'm fucking, I get it. I double it, I go to four plates and I fucking make that for a double. And then he says, that whole fucking thing was horrible. Start over. So they peel it all the way back down to a fucking, to the band again. I can work all the way back up to four plates. I don't make four plates the next time. He about fucking breaks me. But I remember thinking in my head, I just have to make it through this because I want to fucking learn. And if I'm going to go to the hospital, then yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I wasn't impressing anybody with my strength, but I was fucking there for it. Yeah. So the next week, I come back in on Friday. And Gritter laughs at me. He goes, oh, I figured I scared you away. And he was a fucking, when I squatted 700 that day that Joe squatted a grand, it was at an old school meet. Josh Guthrie was my back spotter. Gritter was there. Louie was side spotting. My grandfather came in to watch it. Like, in the first motherfucker smiling was Gritter. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? And so it was one of those things where I never say, I was never no fucking full member. No, I never, but I was around enough to learn. And the guys were nice enough as I met AJ and even Dave helped at night. You know, I have some great videos of Dave lifting off some big board presses for me. And, like, fucking Tony Ramos really helped me a ton. Fucking George Halbert helped me a ton. Mike Wolf helped me. Like, the, the list of guys, because they knew I just love lifting weights. That I wasn't probably going to be able to compete with the actual weights. But, you know, if I look at some of the standards that I was able to make it to, I think for my, whether genetics it was, what I weigh, like, I'm pretty proud of some of the things I did. Um... 
I think the best I did was I went 1755 at uh, weighed like 205, so I didn't make 98 that day. Um, I've been mid 1600s multiple times between you know 198 and 220, and then I just made that 1543 at 81. But that 81 squat for me, that 694.4 was the number two drug tested of all time as a master. It was number 16 non-tested. So when I look at my name and I see Angelo Bardinelli and fucking Coker and those guys like, bro, I never even thought I'd even be on the first fucking page mm -hmm. with dudes like this. Now, it took me till I was 40. It took me all of these years to even kind of look at it, but I'm proud of it because I've been dedicated. I squatted 700 the first time in 2011, and I just did it again, two weight classes, basically lower. I'm still at it every day and I fucking love it and I'm still trying to learn from all these guys. And so I don't know why the fuck they let me in. Yeah. But it, it was it was been unbelievable experience. And now I can mix what I learned from Arnold in person, which was unbelievable, and what I learned at Westside Barbo in person. That's what I was gonna say is at what point did you realize that, you know, that West Side conjugate stuff probably wasn't gonna be the volume that you needed to be in the condition. Yeah. You know, because the conditioning's another side of you as well. You know, you, you I still think that you probably want to be on another fucking cover, but you know, that probably doesn't go away. Like for a lot of us, the strength doesn't go away. Yep. So when did you start to figure out that you needed more volume for the physique aspect yeah. that you probably weren't going to get from the conscious? And, and that's where that evolution went, where I was like, I can have this piece in the beginning of my workout, but yeah. then I need to flip it back to the stuff that made me look this way. But the original, like, the guys from your era at West Side were all pretty fucking jacked, too. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean? Because you guys volume. were doing a, high, a yeah. lot of high volume. So I think what I did was went more bodybuilding specific after the conjugate lift. And then once I started to understand the bands and stuff like that, I added that to it. And what I and then when I, when I tested squatting every day, I got some of the best results of my life because I was front squatting four times a week, back squatting twice a week. And I started not adding bands for dynamic work, but for max effort work. And that's why I talked to Matt Winning. I was like, you know, we do things a lot different in my place. We're front squatting four times a week, back squatting twice a week. And I'm programming three count pauses and five count pauses. And we rotate 200 pounds of bands a week, every lift. The next week, 300 pounds of bands. The next week, 400 pounds of bands. Then we do a fucking a test week. So it's like, we, I rotate things differently than everyone else. And so I didn't do, um, and then if you think about it, every fucking lift is its own different conjugate because Monday week one front squat, two count pause against 200 pounds of bands. The next Monday it's against 300 pounds of bands, then 400 pounds. It's never the same fucking tension lift, whatever. And so we were doing all this randomized Bulgarian mixed Russian conjugate shit. And then I saw all of our guys go, then all of a sudden we had, Multiple 600-pound-plus deadlifters. Multiple 600-pound-plus back squatters. None of my guys weigh over 220. Yeah, They're all 165 to 198 or 220. We had a 700-pound raw 242. Like, I started seeing shit happen in the gym, and then I started making numbers better than I did when I was younger. So I was like, okay, there's something to this. So the baseline, the way I program is, there's a heavy west side influence, obviously. My days are different. We don't do it. We do do a dynamic day now on bench. But the reality is it's like a Bulgarian Russian mix with like a fucking 70s bodybuilding spin. Not because I read it in a book, mostly just because I tested it out and saw the results of being able to do a little bit of both. So, so. with the squatting, does it scale up? Because if you're going 200 pounds of bands and that's your longest pause, yep. I'm going to guess that that's probably your lowest intensity, intensity being percentage of bar weight. Yeah. Well, no, the so the high, the no, so the more the bands go up, then we'd have lower bar weight, obviously, yeah. obviously, right? So it's like, you know, I programmed it so the guys wouldn't be smoked because they're going to take three, four singles and they're done. Yeah. So it's like, it's a pretty quick process. So when people think squat every day, they think Tom Platts. That's not what we're doing. Yeah. We're going, what's your max for that day on that variation? And if we're going to pull that day, they use it kind of as a warm up. So the guys will come in like today and we use mini bands and I'll tell you why. And back to the marketing. Who do you know besides yourself and a couple other guys can choke a fucking blue band in their garage and, and mimic that? The, the internet can't no, really do can't. that. Yeah. So, like, we can do that because we have the equipment. So what I found out is, like, if I double up a red, anybody can do it in a fucking CrossFit gym, in their garage, whatever, just like you guys do it on bench. We just did it on squat. We tested it with the fucking fish hooks and all the fucking stuff. It's like 80 pounds between a, a pair. So I could scale two, three, four a side. So now we're at where we're using a lot more monsters. But like today was 
two monsters on each side and two reds on each side. So it's four bands. This is our cir like our Circamax week, essentially. We got a couple guys doing a meet next week or two weeks from now. So it's like they're going to go, what do they got? One count pause against those bands. And they might have took a quarter today. It's like fucking 500 pounds of tension with a squat bar. You know what I mean? And then they go to pool. Now on Wednesday, we'll take a max effort back squat against that band tension, everything you got. And we found out if we can make 100 to 130 pounds over, we know what we're going to make at the meet. So if we're going to squat 600 at the meet, over, we're going to yeah, have to make meet. 7 or 730 okay. in total tension. We've kind of got that mm -hmm. our, our figured out. And then we, we do a circumax, so we'll go literally two bands, three bands, four bands. And then the week of the meet, we'll take total tension up to the opener. So Wednesday, we also notice with our volume, if we cut it early, we actually do worse at the meet. So we'll take a squat on Wednesday, but if you're going to open up at 500, they might take 400 pounds of bands and a plate and shut it down. But they're still feeling that tension. They won't touch a bar without band tension till we go to the meet that day. And they've had, they've had you know tension for five, six, seven weeks, but that three to four weeks on that Circumax, and, and the guys just keep blowing through weights. We just had uh, Tyler Galbraith, our 220, just squatted 635. We had uh, Zach Matheny, the I think he was he weighed 185, but he was in 198 class. Squatted 600 last meet. Our 165 squatted 550 at the RPS. Um, like I said, last meet, our 242 uh, Brian Callahan squatted 700. My plan is to squat 600 raw next. That's that's what I want to do at either 190. Uh, I want to do it at 198 or 220. Then I'll drip it back down, hopefully to, nine, to 81. My best back squat is 550 raw, and then 700 in in powerlifting gear. But it's like. We're seeing this stuff consistently, and it, and it just keeps on happening. So I'm, I have just, like, aspirations to keep building lifters, which is what I loved about what Louie talked about. He could pull guys out of the, gym, out of the bar and mm -hmm. build an elite lifter. Yeah. I, I believe that I've built myself to that, and I can help build anybody to that. But it is very – he gave the handbook, bro. Mm -hmm. It's like you need a crew, you need test subjects – and you need uh, somebody that has practical application personally, and you can do some amazing things. And so I just watched and learned and said, I want to have my own version of that. And that's what we're building. And it's been unfucking believable. And what I've been able to see, and, and it's just, um, I, I love it. It's like a petri dish of savages. That's what I call it. So how's this work during the week if it's, is this, the, the, the squad is a mainstay, right? So yep. it's either first, second, yeah, it's in, in that rotation. So it's first. Then what's the rest of the week yeah. look like? So great question. So we do very like West Side kind of Mondays, basically. We pull on Mondays. So the guys will take some type of front squat against some type of tension, usually not to a max max, but something solid just to keep it warming up. Then we'll pull. Like today we pulled off a, a thick and a single mat deficit um, sumo deadlift. So we do like a con – and then we go right into bodybuilding basically like back, upper back, back. Then on Tuesdays, we do our max effort bench. And I'll tell you a reason why I put it like this too. Tuesdays, we do our max effort bench, and then we'll hit tricep work. Wednesday is our back squat day, and then we'll do accessory hamstring stuff. So if you make it through Wednesday with me, then you're fucking gold. So it's pull, heavy bench, back squat. Thursday is our secondary bench day, which is like it's some powerlifting, but also bodybuilding stuff. So it's like, you know, chest work, upper back, triceps. And Fridays are fucking arm day. Like, just straight fucking have fun. Some guys will take a heavy front squat without bands on Fridays, then do arms. And we've had uh, one guy front squat 500 that weighed 81. Uh, we've had, like, 12 or 13 guys front squat 455. All of those guys are, are big, you know, the 550 to 600-pound deadlifters, too. We have saw, like, a big correlation on that. Um, and so the reason why I schedule like that, back to the lifestyle. I can't make it on Sundays, man, for speed bench at fucking 8 o'clock. Mm -hmm. I'm with my family. I'll just be honest with you. You know what I mean? Like, I can train. It's early in the morning. Saturdays, I'm at fucking games. I'm at whatever. I'm I'm programming not only for efficiency and to get results. I'm, I'm programming for thousands of people that can try to hold a schedule to get stronger and on top of it look better. And that schedule right there seemed to work the best. You fucking bust your ass Monday through Wednesday, heavy, heavy, heavy. Thursday and Friday's pump work. Shut it down and rest on the weekend. I still lunge, do some GPP. Ready to pull again on fucking on uh, Monday. We did add a speed, uh, after a wedding was on my podcast, we added a speed work 
on Thursdays before we do incline, which is more bodybuilding. So I'll go, you know, very classic like West Side speed work with, for what? with bands for for bench. Okay. And then go and then wait, go. Wait, to isn't like, Wednesday bench day? Uh, it is no. for you guys. Yeah. Wednesday's Tuesday. back squat Tuesday. for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the thing is, so I switched the days up on how I saw the guys do and from what I thought was possible to keep up. How long does it take a new guy to get acclimated? Not a beginner, not a teen, but say somebody that comes in that's in their 20s to get acclimated to that. What's helpful is, I think, because unlike how Westside was set up, you really couldn't do the – you could do the program, but it was never the program, right? Because, like, you didn't know exactly what Chuck and those guys yeah. were doing. These guys can actually do – if I bring on a new guy, which I'm not even looking for any new people at this point. I got enough people. But it's like they can actually do the program – and so, like, my 165, he kept tagging me in his videos. I saw the numbers he was making. He was beating some of the guys I had in the gym. So when he walked in, um, Tyler Old, shout out Tyler, he walked in, he was able to jump right in and compete because he was actually doing the same shit we were doing. Some of us half-assed from his garage, but the reality was, like, I think when the transition comes in, I already know guys are able to, like, be in there. Now, the intensity, the push – the reps, like, you know, because we train fast, too, like how you guys did back in the day. That takes a little bit of time. Um, but we haven't added – since I went private when we moved the gym, like, about a year and a half ago, I have I don't think we've added any new guys. Why would you go private? I was tired of dealing with just general gym, gym members. <laughs> Drama. Yeah, you know, and, and the other thing is, Dave, just like here, I need to be able to walk out and do content. The yeah. gym's not where I make any money. Yeah. The gym is where I train and where I create. And so it's like if I walk out – like, if somebody's in the gym, just like they're in here, they're here for a fucking purpose. Not here because I sold a $30 membership. Mm -hmm. And so that changed everything for us, too. That that I fucking absolutely love. It's the funniest thing because when people ask me, like, hey, you moved the gym. Uh, did all the members come with you? And I go, no, I got rid of them all. Mm -hmm. It's like one of my funniest things ever. But it's, uh, no, that that part's been actually amazing. Mm -hmm. So Well, it does. It, I, I've never had a public gym, nor do I ever want oh. You know, a public yeah. gym or even a private gym, really, for that matter. I mean, I'll have people that will come out. Yeah. yeah. Well, I met a lot you of know, the guys group. we have now. I met through that process. Right. Yeah. So it's like it was needed. But then there was a way where it was like, yeah, it's time to be done with that because I want to just literally I want guys that want to be there so I can test stuff on that. We can join together and go kill these meets, make these numbers and and just have like. You know, camaraderie, man, I think when people leave high school sports, they don't understand why the crews and that stuff works. Like, they don't have a team anymore. At work, half the time, they don't even like people. Maybe they don't even like people at their own house. Like, you need that camaraderie. You need that practice time. You need the game time. The people yeah. miss the game time. The meets are the game time for me. The practice time is at 4 a.m. The camaraderie is the fucking locker room. Like, I've always had that represented in my life, and I think that's made a huge difference. And I think people don't realize how much they miss those things. Well, so it's a weird time, though, too, because the, the days of the powerlifting crews are kind of dead. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to, <clears throat> with with the Swiss Symposium that we just did, it's kind of weird, right? Because we didn't realize th until through half the, half the way marketing, so halfway yep. through when the event's going to come, it kind of hit us that we're trying to market networking, to people that have never <laughs> had to network experience networking, yeah. you know, like come to the event. The most yeah. important time is in the hallway and the Big networking time. and meeting people. But if you have a whole generation of people that don't even know what that means, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you got to change the message. You got to change the marketing somehow. And with that, it was realized a little bit too late from that, but mm -hmm. I know what I'd do differently next time, but it's still kind of a fucking dilemma yeah, because yeah, yeah. how do you, how do you market that online? Yeah. You know, that, that, that's why people were asking about the live stream so much. Yes. But the yes. in-person stuff, when you create like real relationships with people is how you actually get stuff done. Yeah. That's why I think like I was upset I couldn't make it to it because there's like, I mean, the amount of knowledge that's coming yeah. out of that thing. And I know some of the guys, but I don't know some of the guys. It's like unfucking believable Yeah. But they, and that's the crazy thing is, you know, it's to me and it, it, there's a disconnect and I'm trying to work on getting connected back is the the live stream's great right but any time i've ever purchased anything like that or any online service mm -hmm. i might at best absorb 10% of it yeah it's not the same then i don't even deal with the other 90% and then that usually if it's a conference or a meet it can, mm -hmm. it can be a powerlifting meet too um 
it's the relationships and the networking that you actually gain the most contact, sure. most information from. And that disconnect is it's it's a weird one, right? right. And you kind of live in two two worlds there as well because you have the app, right? For sure. Which is just that version, right? Yep. And then the gym, yep. which one feeds into the other, which I understand that. Sure. But are a lot of the people that you get now, do they come from your app? Mm -hmm. Like they've been training, doing your stuff for a couple of years, and then they just want to come up and be part of the crew. Yeah, so uh, originally how we got a lot of people is when we were hosting meets. So guys would be part of the app or doing the workouts, and then when they would never just come to the gym, they'd sign up for the meet. And so then I'd see, you know, a guy go do some decent numbers, and then I'd go over and talk to him and say, you know, Obviously, that you know, and he was wearing stuff like you could tell he was in the game, like with with us, with the with the company or whatever. And he's like, "Yeah, man, I've been doing the workouts for a couple of years." And then he lived fucking ten minutes away, and I'm like, "But it was like for some reason the meets were easier for them to come than just to show up at the gym. I don't know if they're intimidated or whatever." Yeah. A lot of my guys originally came from that, and then <clears throat> over time it'd be like, "Yeah, this friend, that friend." But I started to realize that once I got enough guys in each weight class that were competitive, I quit looking for people. And when I moved the gym, which like I said is about a year and a half now, I really haven't added. I really haven't added anybody. There's a couple guys I want back if they move back because they got jobs or whatever. But the competitiveness and and what we have right now, I got a core group of fucking really strong guys that are about it, that are continuing to make progress, and that um, yeah, I don't I I don't really like. It it would have to take the right type of person at this point because I don't, you know how it is man you don't want to upset the boat yeah. something's going real well it's like you think a guy might come in and push the competition but then maybe he's rubbing the fucking guys the wrong way or maybe that's what they do need we got enough guys that i think are good athletes that are about it enough that are making progress that are doing a bunch of shit on their ex that are pushing each other there's just enough shit talking going on to where like you know it's it keeps pushing the needle so right now but all of it came originally from meats. Yeah. Meats. Well, I mean, on a, on a personal level, because I kind of have the same kind of thing that you don't want. I mean, we I've, I've had crews grow. Right. And then you end up with this drama. And it's, yeah. and it's like it's so big. And I'm not making too. fucking any money from this. No. Like this is actually it's 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 my time. It's like yeah. my only free time. Yeah. And now it's filled with bullshit. Yeah, I don't want that. And it's. And it kind of always, you know, spins around or comes around and then goes away and then comes around and goes away. And it just gets to a point where it's like, fuck it. You know, it's that's what happens when those numbers, yeah. you know, get a little bit. I'm just not going to deal with it either. Like when yeah. I had some guys rivaling the, um, the programming or whatever. I just said, cool, go do it somewhere else. That's it. Yeah. It's that simple. You know, you don't. Uh, my network is just like your network, dude. People wide in. There's a lot of opportunities. If they're around, they're helping, they're whatever. And I'm going to bend over backwards for guys that bend over backwards for me. You want to be disrespectful or you don't, like, understand yeah. what's going on? I ain't got time for it. Yeah. So I'm a hatchet man. I'm I'm the nicest guy you ever met. But also, like, if, if I don't fuck with you, like, I just don't. Well, you don't need it. I guess I is the it. point that I'm yeah. getting to is you don't need it because you're going to be there anyhow. Yeah. Like, no matter what. If so it's that just right there yeah. is the thing a lot of people don't understand. And How's that's that? what I, ex I explain to those guys. Yeah. I'm coming here by myself if no one shows up. You well, I'm sure you have that. many times a, in the past. A, a bunch. So yeah. that's my point. It's like, but if you're here and you want to fucking get it with me, and you're one of the guys in this building, let's fucking get it. Let's fucking capture it. Let's fucking build something awesome. Let's inspire motherfuckers. And let's go some, build something we're fucking proud of. And like... I'm about that, and mm -hmm. I have the resources, and I got, man, fucking, when I was helping some of my high school kids the other day, Travis Mash stopped by, and they're doing cleans that day, and Travis like, you, want, you care if I jump in and help them a little bit? I mean, yeah. And they're like, who's that guy? I'm like, oh, well, he takes guys to the fucking Olympics for Olympics. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, or Joe Bayless jumps in and deadlifts with us one day, and he's, he's helping guys like, or Tony stops by, I'm like, we have the resources to be great if we want to be. Mm -hmm. If we're willing to work, we're willing to show up, you know, we're willing to fucking go through it, and it's like, so, you know, I, I just, I'm really proud of the crew we got right now and what we're accomplishing and where we're going. And I feel like that, you know, my programming's different. The way we do things is different. I never signed up to be like everyone else anyway. Yeah. I always wanted to kind of forge my own path, but I had to, and, and I'm one of the only people on the planet that can say, 
they sat down like this and learned programming from fucking Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, asked them specific questions, wrote programs with him, like, understood really what they were doing, right? And then on top of it, got to do a deadlift session with fucking Louis Simmons, bleeding all over the fucking bar, or got a chance to go, you know, squat up there. Like, I got a chance to live it with two of the fucking greatest people of all time, not every day with either of them, but just enough to learn enough mm -hmm. to apply it myself. And so it's like, you know, I wanted to create a system that anybody can do in their garage or they can do it in their garage and take it straight to the platform or they can say, fuck it. I'm going to go right to the fucking bodybuilding stage. Like I wanted to showcase that that was possible. And that's kind of why we did, you know, four of us did that where we did both in that weekend and we're all real successful at it. And um, we kind of just, at the end of the day, like, I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm fucking living it. Yeah. Where the, the, the industry 25 years in the industry, there's, there's two, two pipes that I'm kind of looking at here. There's, there's the business aspect of staying relevant for 25 years in this industry yeah. is not an easy task. Uh -huh. You know, look at all the people that we've seen come and go. Oh, man. Most within a year or three. For sure. But very, very few are going decades, right? And then keeping your own training relevant, not saying that it needs to be at this high level, but that you need to be able to train fucking hard, yep. right? When you want to, yep. you know, for over two decades. That in itself, when you have the passion for both, provides the push, but it doesn't still provide the relevance. You got to always yeah. be looking, right? Yeah, yeah. So on both, like for business, for example, where do you look now for, and I don't want to say you're looking at your competitors and all this for relevance, because yeah. that's a fucking stupid thing to do. Yeah. Um, I mean, you got to look somewhat to yeah. kind of know, but where do you try to find that relevance? You know yeah. what I'm saying? To, I'm for the to, business side. So I'm trying to see like where, so when I first came in and started really getting heavy in content, a lot of people were on their cell phones. Not a lot of people were supersetting. Like, I think that's part of the reason why Arnold locked in, too, is because his stuff at that point wasn't really how people were training. And so I got a chance to kind of bring it back on this massive stage with Bodybuilding.com and him contributing all the content, too, and all the pumping iron stuff to, like, get some of these younger people, including, like, Cole and some of the guys that work with me. They were in high school then. And so they got a chance to jump in, and they were like, these pumps are crazy, all these supersets, like... It just wasn't really happening, at least, you know, maybe to the masses. And so then I get and I see the multiply and all that stuff. And we saw this cycle where now it's all the t I heard somebody on the podcast called the TikTok dorks or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like I'm seeing a similar type of thing happen again where I think there's another window for the high vault. Like I really don't. I think people start to like they learn how to train, then they forget how to train. Then they learn how to train. Mm -hmm. And I so I think. I'm going to have the second I I'll get hot. I think it's like getting hot again, which sounds funny, but I think it's coming right now yeah. because I think what's happening in my opinion in the gym is very similar to what happened 2006, seven, eight, when I was kind of rocking and I provided information for people that was unaware of it. Didn't know what that even feels like. Good pump, hard training, understanding even basic level conjugate stuff like I can kind of bring that, I think, back to the masses, maybe a younger age group again, and inspire my own age group. You know, I turned 44 this year. Like the things I'm still able to do, whether it's with my kids, whether it's still compete, um, I'm still doing it at a, a reasonably high level. And so I think I've got an opportunity to teach some younger people and maybe re-motivate some older people. And so I think my net's actually getting wider because for some reason I've always talked to a younger demo. My demo is 25 to 35. That's who buys my supplements and does my programs. I think it's because they were in college whenever MP was jumping at the, the UFC stuff. But it's like I've always talked to that younger demo, but I'm now starting to flip and say, can I talk to this older demo too? And so I'm looking at where's my spots at? Where is my spots? Where is the content that I'm creating right this second and passionate about? Where can it help the biggest group of people? And I think it's on both sides. I think it's yeah, the difference order. now, though, that I see is, unlike with the muscle farm, you're positioned in such a way now to catch more fish Yeah. because you have revenue streams through content yep. and through the supplements. Yep. Where with muscle farm, had you had that revenue stream for content, yeah. it would have been way higher margin. For sure. Made a big know, difference. But it also would have went to 
somebody else. Exactly. You know, so there's it was there's, meant for the right that. timing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's that. That, so cha- that. that change understanding that changed my life and gave me all the freedom. Yeah. It just did. Yes. Because when I understood that I had given this much content for so many years that people are willing to pay a nominal amount for it now because I was enriching their lives. And I was putting all kinds of pot. I mean, there's so much stuff on there. It's it's outrageous, like amount of content. But it's like that that changed everything for me for my family. When that first spun, though, right? Was that because one of the one of the challenges that I have is with 25 years of giving it all away for free. Mm-hmm. You know, then we come up with you know like a table talk crew. You yep. know, kind of like a, a little bit of a paywall to help support the podcast. It's it's a hard sell because so many people are like, what the fuck? You've been giving this shit away for 25 yeah. years for free. How did you cross that chasm? Yeah, that was and and I was worried about that. So I didn't know if it'd work. Yeah, Dave, to be honest, like I saw some other guys. So you gotta figure this is 15, 2015, so it's pretty early for that whole type of thing. There was another guy that was in fitness that was on a bunch of covers named Greg Plitt that passed away uh, maybe like five or six years ago. But he had done it and done really well. And I knew a person that knew him. I didn't know him really. I Like, I knew him, but not well. And they had told me some of his numbers. And I was like, that's interesting. And I was starting to think, like, oh, I've seen what's happened on bodybuilding.com. Like, if I ever shift out of here, like, I'll, I'll try it. You know, but once again, I was charging $9 originally. Now it's 15 bucks, And this is all normal stuff for so many employers yeah. to do it. But at that, it was very new. And I'm like, will this fucking work? I started thinking to myself, like, the amount of people that have done my training programs, like on Bodybuilding.com, was so astronomical. I figured I could get a percentage of it. So I launched the website, and day one, I have 800 members. Mm-hmm. Day one, 2015. And I'm like, oh, this is real. No, that's this a good is, start. This, yeah, yeah, that's a good start. start. This is a real business. Yeah. So then, you know, I don't ever share my real numbers with yeah. people, but I was able to say, oh, my gosh. Okay, people do value what I've been doing and that – now this is what I do. Mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I started working on supplements, but I couldn't really deal with it for like a year. Yeah. So everything went into, and I'm in a little, like small gym in my basement, working on content, shooting videos. Like I don't have anybody full time doing it mostly on my own. It, it just like, but it was. But when I saw that, I was like, what could this really be? And I'm ahead of it. I knew I was. Yeah. And so that that gave me the indication. And I had people from literally India, the UK, like there's right now, there's a 80 to a hundred countries at any point in time represented on the app. It's wild. You know, and I got a full content team and full everything like, you know, cause we've been doing it for so long now, but it's like that right there told me everything I needed to know. Now, if it had been 200 people would have felt the same way, probably. Cause I still would at the end of the oh, day yeah. would have been like, you know what I mean? I was just hoping somebody was going to join yeah, yeah, the motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. And it was terrible compared to what's going on now. But that gave me the, inf- you know, and I knew the millions of people were doing my shit or like hundreds, like a lot yeah. because bodybuilding.com was giving me all the analytics, but I still didn't know if that would actually transfer over. And when, um, that right there, it, it changed our lives forever. And then I started realizing one, better margin obviously because it's ip it's it's content yeah, yeah, yeah and then on top of it these will be the same people if i can continue to get them results that will then buy hopefully the new supplements when i start that brand you know a year later uh, yeah that was gonna be my follow-up question to that why even bother with the supplements that's what my wife said you know what I'm and, saying? and i'll tell you and i'll tell you why I, I i really like the supplement business because i know how much it helped me in my training and i really still thought that i could provide a better you know, supplement regimen, because I knew the programming I was giving these people or they were buying, I knew what they needed. I thought I did. So I created the supplements for exactly what I would take or my guys would take to recover from what we're doing to ourselves. And so it literally just fed together the same way. And I knew that there was going to be a percentage of buyers that just mess with my content from MP that would want to support it. So why not create a quality company to do direct to customer, not take on retailers, and just go build, uh, hopefully, like a good life. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then just enjoy what I'm doing: training, supplements, uh, podcasting, content, books, whatever. Well, the supplements are coming to the tough industry though because the margins start to get fucked, especially recently because of all the everything's you know crazy high too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, a lot of companies just start skimming their shit to get the margins yeah well and what i i started having to do like 
you know, creatine like skyrocketed. I had to lower my servings. You know, obviously I put out everything yeah. that we, but it's like the, there is, I've been able to hold on to not a crazy price increase. And for the most part, everything stayed the same during all this wildness. But the reality is, is that the same people that are doing the, the programs, same people have been supporting her, similar people that are, you know, taking the supplements and um, it's been a profitable business, but it's had some challenges most recently, just like a lot of other businesses. But yeah, I, I've really, I've really enjoyed it. It's been good. Do you worry about being, you know, the the front face of the app, the training, and the supplements as you're growing older and out of your demographic? For sure. Which is why I think what's interesting is is that that's why it's good. I have a lot of young guys I train with, right? Which definitely helps. They keep me young for sure. My son's 17, so he keeps me young. Yeah. My oldest son. Well, they keep you young, but the brand's another thing. For sure. And so that's why having more people as I get older, I'll start to have more people in for content for sure. Yeah. But the uh, I've thought about that a lot. And here's the other thing is, and a lot of people don't think about this, like to be the guy on camera, content, creation, and also be the guy that's doing the numbers and the bullshit and stuff like that, it's not the same part of the brain. At least it ain't in my brain. Mm -hmm. And so what I have a hard time balancing probably the most is like I'm reading a balance sheet. I'm working on, you know, the growth forecasting for, because, you know, supplements take eight and 12 weeks to come in. So it's like not like, oh, I'm out of protein, get it tomorrow. Like we're yeah. forecasting, you know, quarter or more. So it's like when I do that, then if you ask me to do this, it's not as good. So Or if I'm creating content for the app. So it all has to be segmented pretty well to help, help balance it. Um, that's probably the trickiest part um, that I have. And then, yes, what is the transition as I get even older to be able to keep the demo, which I haven't figured that all the way out yet, but that's definitely something I've thought yeah. about multiple times. Was, my question was going to be, how do you do that, right? Because it's, I deal with that same, because we have under 15 people here. So I yeah. deal with that same thing where the business side, you know, understands, okay, here's where your greatest value is. Yeah. The content, this, this, and this. But to be able to do that, I still have to do this, 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 and this. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of administrative shit. For sure. That people would shit that they knew I actually did. Yeah. I'm right? the same way, Dave. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then you're like, fuck, you know, this is where it needs to be. But it always seems like that's what gets hurt the most. Yep. Because that can almost pause a little bit, but you can't pause sales. You no, can't no, pause no. cost of goods sold. You can't pause no. putting SKUs on the website. No. Well, and I can't pause that I'm worried about that stuff or yeah. I'm trying to figure it out while I'm trying to be happy Corey on camera yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So uh, that was part of the thing that I struggle with the most going into where I'm all the way the main guy. I was never the CEO of Muscle Farm. Yeah. I was the co-founder. I was yeah. the either president or, you know, the second guy or third guy or whatever. And so it's like now that I'm the first guy, Yeah. smaller business, but still multiple businesses, that the answer, I, I'm really relying on my team. I got a, a team of killers at Max Effort and a, on the app too. And I'm always asking for feedback, but ultimately it's my decision. And when, you know, I'm not going and raising money and doing things yeah. like that. Like the money is that's happening is coming from the company or myself at this point. So it's like, you know, it's one of those things where that was a little bit of a transition to say, like, if I've got two or three weeks or something where I'm dealing with a bunch of numbers and shit and I can get out of a groove of content. So that, that, that part I've, I've came up with, um, a thing for myself where I don't get on social media till like 12 or one o'clock, like to consume any, sometimes I'll repost stuff from morning training, but post it. I'm out. Like I'm not in there consuming, taking my brain. I don't read my email before I go train. Yeah. Like I have little things like that that have kind of helped me so I can keep it in buckets. I train and that's what I'm doing. Even the guys that try to bring up business stuff during training, that because I train with a lot of guys that I, that, yeah. that work with us too, very like it's not very like I I try not to do it. Like we might chit chat quickly, but I'm not about that at that time. I'm there to fucking work out. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I've tried to really segment those things to help me, because when they cross over, man, it's it's like nothing gets all of the attention. It's tough. Well, at the end of the day, if if when you're the main guy. At the end of the day, if something doesn't get done, no matter what that thing is, you're doing it. Correct. <laughs> you know, and that that yeah. that becomes that suck. You know, <laughs> yeah. and I also think that becomes the the part of business that you know we probably all don't talk about enough. Yeah. You know, like look, man, the trash doesn't get taken out for three days. Guess who's fucking taking it yeah, out? Yeah, for you sure. know, if. Um, reposting shit doesn't get reposted, then you're, you're the one that's answering reposting. comments, whatever. Answering I comments. I do all that stuff too, yeah. You know, liking comments, all these different things. And a lot of them are just 
so fucking remedial, administrative, stupid shit. Yeah, but, it's, that, but it takes it all. You know, but it, it takes the time. And again, if it doesn't get done, yeah. you're going to have to do it. And I think a lot of people start a business and they're like, okay, I'm going to have that business. And then I'm just going to hire somebody to do this. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you know, hiring somebody to do that, it may take you or I, you know, 15 minutes a day to actually do that. Yeah, you're not yeah. going to hire one person no. just to come in to send tweets. No, 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 no. And it, I, I've never, ever had anybody even help me with social media, the creation of stuff. But, like, I just now recently had somebody help me, like, schedule stuff because I was creating so much stuff it wasn't even getting out. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Treadway, like, you know, but like the graphics guy, the graphic gangster, Cole Susack, and we got two really good camera guys, um, Trey Speed and Content Kyle, and then I got Small Arms Danny, who's like my content small editor. It's, yeah, his arms are kind of big, though. We call him Small Arms. <laughs> Shout out Small Arms. So it's like we've got um, like a team now that can grab all the craziness that we're putting together so I can be more effective because if I can just create with that bucket – it's a wrap, right? Yeah. And then the same. Th so I just kept having people around that I knew would complement the skill set that could keep uh, keep track of stuff. Same thing with Max Effort. I got a, a, just a, a killer group there, but it's small and it's the um, I'm just not hiring the same skill set that I got. I, I, I need I, I do a few things really well mm -hmm. and I do a lot of things not very yeah. well. And I realized that a long time ago. And that's when I figured that out, especially when I became, quote unquote, the main guy. Yeah. I was like, oh, I'm in trouble. Even my mom with customer service on the Corey G Fitness app, she's a killer, bro. We was in that trailer. You trying to get nine bucks on her, she ain't having it. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. She's like, I ain't trying to, they're trying to get one over on this. You don't fuck around, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like everybody in their spot. Like uh, my guy, Tyler Sealover, is the operations guy at Max. I tell him all the time, motherfucker, I don't want your job. I can't do it anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? I need people that are in their lanes that are killers. And, you know, if they wear out and they move on, that happens. But right now, just like kind of in the gym, we've got a team that has been unbelievable. And, and, and the other thing is, is building businesses with my high school friend. I mean, Dustin Myers, um, I started lifting weights with when I was 16 years old. We've owned old school gym together this entire time, 20 years. He's a partner of Max Effort. He was strength coach at Ohio State uh, for the wrestling team when they won the national title. He's got his lane of things that he's done content-wise. I got my lane, but, dude, we started fucking bench pressing together sophomore years in high school in the Ohio Valley. Like, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like stuff that's happening in our gym and in our businesses that's been happening for a really long time and that has like this organic – um, authentic to, thing to it that is just like you can't try to do it. It just has to happen. You know what I mean? And so I think that's why after all these years it's still going on because we're not faking this shit. It's just what we love to do, Dave. Yeah. And um, that's why I was excited to come here, to be honest with you, because I feel like sometimes the business gets in the way of the training. Sometimes people don't know how the training got there. Not that I really owe anything to anybody at the end of the day of, of explanations, but I like people to hear that this didn't come on accident. It's a lot of hard work, a lot of belief, a lot of learning, a lot of pitfalls. Some things work great, some things didn't. But like Arnold said, like, how do you stand back up from it? How do you keep going? How do you build? How do I keep putting myself out there? Part of the reason why I started squatting every day is because I went to a meet down in Tennessee where like Tony and those guys were helping me. And it was a Saturday, Sunday meet, Saturday amateur, Sunday pro. So a lot of the West Side guys were on Sunday. So I, I'm supposed to squat 700 at 181. Louis calling me on, you know, for my my depth and shit. And I open up at 650 and I miss all three of them. I fucking bomb out. And I fucking, then I have to sit there all day Sunday and then Tony fucking bombs out. And we both drive home from Tennessee. Not one of us fucking made one squat. And I literally came home and I was thinking, what is the most outrageous shit I can fucking do? And I typed in Google, what happens if I fucking squat every day? I swear to you, that's what I typed in. And John Bros came up. <laughs> And I read John Bros's article on T Nation. I fucking started doing it. I reached out to John. I went to Vegas. I fucking, during the, one of the Olympias, I learned from him too. He taught me about this, this stuff that he had learned from one of the Bulgarians. And that was it. I was like, I'm never letting that fucking happen to me again. I was embarrassed as hell. Because I, I had trained that whole fucking training block went good. I thought I was going to do a good numbers. And I went and fucking, and I bombed out. 
And that's the fucking, I'm pretty sure it's the last time that's ever happened to me because I was like, I'm not, this isn't fucking working. I need something different. I need something extreme back to the volume shit we talked about. I was like, I need some shit that's going to force me to get fucking stronger. That's where that shit came from. It was because I was so fucking pissed that in the moment when I went to a meet where there's a lot of eyes on me and I even had people coming to watch me, I fucking, I ate it, dude. I fucking bombed out. I had a hard weight cut. It just didn't fucking work. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. But to me, it was unacceptable. So I came home and said, I'm going to fucking squat every day. And after 30 days, I started posting it. And that's when that whole thing started going. And then when I started thinking about dyna- the dynamic effort with the bands, I said, well, what happens if I just start fucking squatting against them every fucking day too? And then change the fucking program. It's all evolved because, including my life, because I was pissed about the outcome. And I was like, I'm going to put the fucking work in to figure it out. And then when I figure it out, and then I prove it in my own gym, then I'm going to tell fucking people about it. Well, I think that's the biggest thing. It's not so much those actual metrics. It's the mindset of you get smacked. Yes. Right? And when you get smacked, you get pissed, upset, and we all do. But at some point, you you start thinking, I'm going to figure this out. Yes. That, right, that moment right there is where most people drop the fucking ball. Yeah. Like, it can be storming and raining and fucking, you know, just a complete fucking disaster. But if you got the right mindset, it's like, okay, just fucking keep bringing it because yes. it's going to stop. Yep. And I'm going to figure it out. 100%. And that's, and that's exactly what I locked on to. And then locked on to just like, you know, Ramos was always really good when he would go to meets with me. And he'd be like, look, some of these motherfuckers want to see you get it. Some don't. Bring them. Let's, let's see the fucking show, G. Show, show these motherfuckers, you know, so I had like the right guys in my ear. I, I got pissed off enough and I kept putting myself out there and I, and then I started get you know, gaining some fucking traction. My weight started going up. I started fucking being able to help a lot of people. I was on Barbell Shrug, which was a really popular podcast back then. And like, I don't know, like 13 or 14, I started having strong men reach out, Olympic lifters, crossfitters, bodybuilders, power lifters, athletes, squat every day shit goes across all people. I got, didn't even realize how wide that was. And they were like, well, yeah, I'm probably stronger than this dude, but this motherfucker is getting it. And I, and, and I'm not fucking scared. I'm missing weights. I'm posting them. I'm making weights. I'm posting them. I go squat 550 at 98, 540 at 81 raw. And then I put fucking gear on and go squat 700 and I'm doing some stuff. And I'm just consistently showing it because a lot of people don't want to show like, oh yeah, today sucked. <laughs> fucking 365 mm-hmm. felt heavy, but I'd still post it. So it was like I just got on this process where I was like just real transparent about what I was trying to do and then people started locking onto it. And then the program just kept evolving over time. And now it's came into this conglomerate of all of these mix of all these fucking problems that I was pissed about that I was just, you know, willing to put myself out there. And, you know, I got some stuff banged up from here and there, like I fucking ripped my labrum and this hip. You know, the the day after I squatted 700 the first time, I thought I could squat more. So the next week I squatted 740 and fucking tore my labrum like an idiot. Then I fucking ripped off this uh, super spinatus, completely ruptured it like three years ago, um, just doing a fucking the arc bar on incline, fucking around. So here we go. Like, I'm like, all right, here's another challenge. Do I get it fixed? Do I want to be shut down eight months or do I figure it out? I went and saw Louie. I went and saw Matt Winning. I went and saw Serrano. And I said, fuck it, I'm not going to get surgery. So I have a, a completely ruptured supraspinatus in my left shoulder. Still can low bar squat. Just be, I can bench 315 again with no pain. I figured it the fuck out. I figured it out from programming. I figured it out from talking to really smart people and, and just programmed around it. And so every time I, I face these things, I look at them as challenges and opportunities, honestly, to fucking keep it moving. How do you... Try, how do you instill that mindset in the people that you're mentoring and trying to help? Because yeah. that was probably developed from your grandfather yeah, going yeah. way back, right? A lot of the people that we're going to be talking to are older. Yeah, yeah, Right? And it's a fucked up thing because sometimes you wonder, can you even instill this? And your kids are another thing. Like, how are you going to instill yeah. this in your kids? Yeah, that's been a tricky thing because kind of like you talked about earlier is they can't know what your pain was, right? Mm-hmm. So they have an inability so when I say, well, that shit is soft, or I used to have to do this, I sound like some old guys talking about, like, yeah. I walked there with no shoes on or some shit, right, through the snow. And I started to realize, like, their situation, they, they, they have an inability to feel what it was to go be a coal miner. They have an inability to feel that their mom was like that and that we lived in a trailer. They have an inability, like, to feel those things. But what I can do 
is I can tell them the stories and I can showcase the work and I can explain to them what I had to do to get here. And what you're watching, kids are watching you, man. They're not going to really listen, but like the consistency, the understanding, like what I wanted to not only do is break the trend of like people, like the, the poverty or the money or that understanding of in coal mining was, was more like, I want my kids to be able to like what they do for a living. Yeah. I want my kids, I wanted to afford my kids an opportunity to say, I want to go do this. I don't want to feel like I have to do this. And I think like, you know, is a quality of life thing. So, but I'm showing them through getting up every day through, and I'm transparent on the business stuff, especially as my older one has got older. I've shared some stuff with them. Like, yo, this isn't, it might look easy, but this shit ain't easy. This is the shit dad's dealing with right now. This is the fucking bullshit I've had to go through. Here's the problems I've had. Here's the things I've learned. And I, and I'm getting the questions and I'm getting in the gym was a huge part of it. You know, him, him getting in a hardcore gym, training with a crew, getting strong. He did his, my oldest did his first powerlifting meet, um, the end of last year, which was awesome at 148. He squatted 402, pulled 402. Like I was really proud of him. And just like rap, that was probably the weirdest thing. Wrapping my kids knees <laughs> for a big squat at a sanctioned meet and him like telling me like that, I'm going to make this. I got another one. Like the confidence I saw, he's, he's, uh, a pretty shy kid originally, but like what I saw through the weights, which was a different experience for him, but the same experience that I had. And so I was able to kind of replay that again. And now the business questions that I'm getting, but I'm starting to back it up by saying, but you see what's going on. You see the consistency, you see the work. So I'm trying to show them because they can, I can't, they can never feel it the same. Yeah. If you know what I mean? And then the people I'm talking to, I just let them know, like some old guy told me a long time ago, like, just don't ever quit. Literally, just don't ever fucking quit. Keep showing up, keep moving, and that nothing that's great's going to last forever and nothing that's shitty is going to last forever. And if I just keep that in mind, so when people come to me like, gee, how do I start personal training then I get to where you're at? I'm like, it's a long fucking process, man. What's your entry point? Mm-hmm. That's why I keep telling, what's your entry point? Where's the first fucking meet? Where, where's the first show at? Like, how do you get in? You ain't going to be me or you tomorrow. It's impossible. It, it's too much work. But it's like, where do you start at? So you can just start the fucking process. My start was folding towels, watching a guy personal train. At, you know, in, in oh, I think too home. many want to start midway. They all want to start midway. Yeah. We all would like to start at the top. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. fucking work that way. So it's like, the sooner you understand that that's not going to fucking happen. Yeah, there's some hacks out here, but at the end of the day, like, it really is as hard as we say it is. It really is that much work and time, and you can speed up the process a little bit with, with stuff that's out here now. But understand, like, that's what it really takes. I think that's the reason why I don't have millions of fucking followers. I have hundreds of thousands because I'm telling motherfuckers to work. Mm-hmm. Oh, you you want to come to my program? We lunge 400, 800 meters after lifting weights for an hour and a half. You want to sign up for that? Uh, You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I'm not saying here's the 20-minute fucking jazzercise shit. Like, I'm saying you're going to get results. And that's why I always say, like, I'm not for fucking everybody. I'm for anybody, but I'm not for everybody because I'm asking you to work on yourself. A lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to do personal development. I'm asking you to fucking do shit that not everyone else is doing. I'm asking you to make sure that you can fucking like push in the gym. Like, you know, I'm not the fucking trainer you're coming to for the easy way. But if you fuck with me, I'm going to probably change your life. And I've changed a ton of people's lives and I've changed my own life. And it's like, that's what I'm preaching. And so I think that's why some people are like, uh, you know, I don't know if this is for me, but you know, we're changing like, dude, we had 1700 people do our before and after contest last year mm-hmm. at max effort. That's a fuckload of people and about uh, maybe like 65% or so fucking finished it. So it's like thousand people that fucking have a great, like solid before. And that's a lot of fucking people, man, that yeah. actually started and finished it. That actually took the supplements, did the training, like, you know, that's like, that's a, that's a lot of fucking people. We can have a million followers and everything, but when I saw, like, and had to go through before and afters and see these changes, read their shit that they write about how much it changed their lives, it's all the oxygen I mm-hmm. needed, man. But it's like, preaching that work is is not the easiest market. <laughs> no, no, but I believe if you're wrong, you're transparent, even with, even with your kid, right? Yeah. That they may decide, you know what? Having my own business isn't going to be for me. Yeah, and, and it, that's fine. As long as they know, I and right? I and I tell them that if you're not want to sign up for that, like I get it. I just want you to do what you like to do. Yeah, but if you're not transparent, then they won't know what yeah. it's really about. Yeah, 
and it's a different, it's like you're telling them the lunge is straight up front. Yeah. You know, you can hide that shit and say, look, sign up. They're going to be able to walk for two weeks. Yeah, and yeah. Fuck this then guy. after they <laughs> sign up, you know, then you yeah. could, you know, maybe your membership's double. Yeah. Right. Because of that, then you slip it in there, but that's, that's not. But there's no staying power in that. So that's yeah. what I realized. Like if I'm going to grab and help people and build these businesses or hopefully raise the, the kids I'm proud of, like, I can't really pull any punches, man. It has to be as real as possible. And if it can be real as possible, then it can't be threatened. I mean, I think that that at the end of the day, like, you know, people know what they're going to get and, and I'm proud of that. And I think that there's another wave that it will get bigger, that it will reach more people. And I think that's why I try to do even more content based around the confidence to let, you know, a wider net know that there's some things here I can help people with, but it's like, I'm asking them to be disciplined. I'm asking them to show up. And that's hard for a lot of people. But if they can get past that, I think there's a lot of help there from the stuff that I'm doing. And I've seen it. It's, it's, it's been wild. The stuff with my kids has been interesting, Dave, because being on social media and having verified accounts and still posting stuff and having muscles or whatever, like, it's weird when your kids get a little older. And, and, and I try to tell them, like, all right, listen, it just kind of is what it is. Like, I fuck with them. I'm like, your dad is fucking cool. You're just going to have to deal with it, like, mm -hmm. whether they believe that or true or mm -hmm. not. But the reality is that I found a spot where I could help some of the kids in training, you know, and the, the kids are all coming through the gym. They're seeing how passionate I am about it. They know that's what we do. They all follow YouTube influencers and shit anyway. I'm like, that's basically, quote, unquote, what I've done my entire career, create content, create businesses, and help people. And so they've lived that. So that's their norm. My norm was my dad went to the coal mine and drove yeah. truck. Their norm is dad's at the gym, which is grimy and real, but people in India are doing the workouts. People in Ireland are doing the workouts. And so it's like I'm able to showcase that so I hope then they believe they can do whatever, whatever they want mm -hmm. because they watched it. You know what I mean? But the baseline of like super hard work around it, obviously. Well, they're seeing everything that's going on at home too. Yeah, so they're yeah. seeing all of it. Right. They're yeah. seeing the the days I'm really fucking tired. Yes. The days that mom's like, yo, you need to shut down the email, you know. Yeah. And my wife Rachel, which is I mean, she signed up for the craziest fucking thing. Like, I'm coming out of the coal mine telling her, you know, I meet her dad. Yeah. And he's like, What are you, you know, what are you gonna do? I go, Well, I wanna be a personal trainer model. <laughs> and yeah. I'm coming out of the coal mine and you know, like she's got her master's in education. She was going more traditional route and I've got all these big hopes and dreams. And, you know, she took a chance on supporting me. And then, you know, when my son was born, he's 17 now, she quit work to help with the businesses. And, you know, we had to cash her IRA out to pay for the fucking, the mortgage for, you know, a year so I could start MP. Like she's been ride or die the whole fucking time believing in me. I don't know if she always understood it the whole time, but she just believed I would figure it out. And that support, like I always say, like if you have chaos at your house, and then your job's chaotic because we're building these businesses. That's tough, man. So I always had like a real good support system. I've never had a big circle of people. If people show themselves to me and, and they're not supportive or good, I just don't fuck with them. I, I say I'm allergic to drama. Mm -hmm. I'm a fucking, that's why that, that shit you talked about, that don't fly with me. Mm -hmm. That shit starts happening in my gym. I'm done. Like, you know, it just takes away. I'm not trying to take myself off the path, man. I'm trying to go on the fucking path. So like if you're taken away from it, I'm, I'm out. And so that has been a huge part of, I don't let that shit linger in my life. I never have. Some people think it's mean, but to me, it's like, you know, family members and stuff, I'll give a little bit more leniency to, but I don't really have a lot of problems there either. And if they do, I'm just, I'm just not around them a lot. So it's like, I've just tried to do a good job of saying like, I'm focused I'm about my family. I'm trying to build these businesses. I want to like what I do and impact people, but I'm trying to like keep my circle real small um, so I can stay, you know, in this path of like, attempting to go the right yeah. direction <laughs> tell me how to, tell me about a time it doesn't matter when it was yeah. where you um you seriously questioned if it was even all worth it yeah um i think that right whenever i was uh saying that time frame where i was asking rachel she's she had already quit her job as a teacher and i was getting ready to give away my clients to start the mp thing and in the first year although or let's say first few months, it did well. But the first year and a half, we still really weren't even paying ourselves because we were adding employees and trying to do it. And like, I'm still personal training a little bit. She doesn't have a job. We're cashing out and took the penalty on her IRA. And I'm starting to think like, before I did this, 
I was training four days a week in the gym, Monday through Thursday. I had online clients Wednesday night. I was making about 100000 a year, had all this freedom. And I'm like, what the fuck did I trade that in for? But then I thought to myself, if you really, because I looked up to Bill Phillips. That was like my guy, the mm-hmm. AS guy, right? And I got a chance to work with him a little bit too, which is amazing. But if I was like, if I, and this is in my mind, if I really want a chance to be my version of Bill Phillips, like in my head, right? I have to fucking roll it one time. I'm, I'm a person that doesn't want to live in regret. And I think everyone thinks that, right? I really, in that moment, thought, all right, this right now doesn't really feel like I traded, like a, I traded a shittier lifestyle, way more stress for, you know, and I'm a big family guy. So I'm like, this is weighing on them. My kids are starting to be born. And I'm like, all right, G, you got, if you're going to go for this, it's got to be everything because your window is going to be small and it's got to, it's got to go overdrive next. It's got to really change everything. And so I, I just, I just told Rachel, like, you know, I'm probably just not going to be around a lot the next couple of years because I've got to do, I've got to fly all these places. I got to meet with these vendors, create all this content, do whatever is necessary to try to, to give this chance, this thing, a real chance to change our lives. And I questioned it a lot of times because I was so fucking stressed. That's part of how I ended up being 240 one time. I think like when I first started going to West Side, I was just eating and lifting because I was so fucking stressed out. Before I know it, like Amy was still calling me the lean guy, but fuck, I definitely wasn't that lean. I definitely wasn't meant to weigh 240. And, you know, I was just like, I woke up one day and I'm like, yeah, tying my shoes. I fucking blood pressure's up. I'm fucking stressed to the max. And I'm like, I don't even know who this guy is. I need to get my shit together. You know what I mean? And um, I questioned that a couple times during that time. But I'm glad I went through it. And I'll never regret that I didn't roll the dice heavy once to try to do the fucking top, top, top thing. And then now, I really don't feel like I have to do that, honestly. Because I really, really fucking... Now it's just a different way. How can I scale the business? It be profitable. I can make a good life for myself. And... Enjoy, enjoy life. Yeah, so I would say we, that I wasn't really enjoying it during that time at all. When you were at 241, you started asking yourself, like, this is not how I should be. No. What was the first thing that you did to change that? Yeah, I said, um, I'm going to sign up to, well, two things. I had some good, like, uh, contacts at that point because I had been leaner before. I set up um, a magazine shoot with a friend in Vegas during the Olympia. So I put myself a time frame, And I think this is something a lot of people don't do too. Is like, I gave myself a fucking benchmark. I said, I'm going to be in shape for this photo shoot at this time. And I'm just committed to it. I'm going to, you know, gather the content the whole time, help promote the supplements, help promote the training. And I got in the best shape of my life. It ended up, I think that one photo shoot came, four covers came from it. And then I just went on a fucking streak. That was like, Every other fucking month I was shooting bang, 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 bang. And that was like a really productive because my whole thing was if I'm going to get my discipline up, like where's my discipline at? And it wasn't good enough. I needed to get to another level. And that, in my mind, helped propel everything because not only was our company growing, but I was in tip-top shape for content, the most confident, and I was banging on all cylinders at the same time. So then when I do get the opportunity to meet Arnold, I'm ready for that fucking meeting. I'm ready. I'm confident. I know what I'll do. And I believe he wants to be my business partner by the end of it, right? If I don't make that switch, I don't know if that same guy is in that. One of the things, actually, I brought it with me. Um, during that time frame, like I was getting ready to shoot for Fitness RX, And this is probably one of my favorite things. Oh, maybe I didn't bring it. Oh, yeah, here it is. So... I was shooting for that magazine and all three of my kids jumped in for a picture at the end of it. I was super diced up. They did it at old school. And that was only like eight or 10 uh, pictures at the end. Wasn't even supposed to be on anything. So a month later, Per Burnell calls me and says, dude, I think we're going to use the co- cover with your kids. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? He's like, yeah, we'll run it during like Father's Day and all that. It's probably like one of the awesome, most awesome calls I ever got in my life. So during the, the Arnold meeting... Somebody buys this at the airport. I don't even think to fucking bring it. I wish I thought I did, but I didn't. So I go, and I'm literally walking by it on newsstands on the way to L.A., Santa Monica, you know, down by Muscle Beach and shit. And I I fly in, I see it. During the meeting, you know, Arnold, we're talking about, you know, trying to pitch him to be our business partner or whatever. 
And I said, yeah, you know, I'd really like to get a hold of the old pumping iron footage. I could, I could, I think do the marketing, the programs. And somebody throws him that during the meeting. And he goes, he just stops. He goes, this is pretty cool. And he said, you know, kids. And, and then he starts, the meeting just stops. He just starts thumbing through it. Well, the good thing is, is it was at the original old school. So it's grimy. Mm -hmm. Looks 1970. And he keeps talking. And then all of a sudden he pulls out this fucking poster bang and he's like talking about oh frank zane the abs this and that i'm fucking losing it dave during the meeting i'm like holy shit this motherfucker he's a bodybuilder i know that but he's so larger than life he walks in he doesn't even look real it's like being around mj or tiger or something yeah. right but he locked on to the discipline to the training and so if i don't make that switch in that moment and say i'm not keeping myself at the level i need to be for what's fucking happening in my life then I go on this streak where I shoot all of this stuff and all of that happened at the right time to the point where I think the culmination of it to a certain degree was walking in, getting the opportunity to pitch that man, which was my idol and pretty much everyone's idol in the industry to be our business partner. And I don't care what anyone says, the business shit, all that shit, it was rocking. There's no question. So that, that was interesting. But shit changed when this got thrown on the fucking table. And when he understood... High level of discipline, understands the fucking, he saw the training facility, he asked me about the videos, uh, the way that I was putting stuff together, it changed everything. I would say shit changed the day you decided not to be 241. It helped, for right? sure. Yeah, because yeah. without that, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Right? And that's not guaranteed. No. Your decision not to be 241 is guaranteed. Yeah. Because that's shifted in your everything. control. It, right? shifted, it shifted everything because I just realized I wasn't keeping, I wasn't the guy that I thought I would be. When I was there. Now I was learning a lot and I was doing powerlifting and I was eating and I was stressed, but I had the shift to now who's the face of this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that and that's what I did. And I think that changed because then people are believing the training more, they're understanding more, they're seeing me out there. It changed it changed a lot. Well, business is about opportunities. Nobody's yeah. gonna deny that. No, for right? sure. Right. But are you ready for the opportunities if they come? <laughs> I wouldn't have been. If we see what I'm saying, that yes. that's the difference. Yeah. I walked in there like a really confident person that I knew that historically, if I could get the go to the industry to be my business partner, that I would always stand beside him to some degree, and I have, and that I would be able to learn from him, and that, that I would be pissed if I couldn't lock this in, and I used all the stops, and I didn't even think to use that one. It totally was by accident, but um, that right there was like a big part for my career because then it was like, no one's, to me, no one's bigger than Arnold. Even when I worked with Tiger, I didn't grow up wanting to be Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods is awesome, and I love golf, but I wanted to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. So when I met Tiger and I worked with him, I was like, Tiger was just a dude. That's funny to say that, but that's how he was. But it's like, that's Arnold the dude mm -hmm. in our world, right? And so it was like one of those things, like, I think my confidence when I went through that, when Arnold's looking at a pullout poster of me in a fucking business meeting, I'm like punching myself in the face going what the fuck is happening right now but when I made that shift and I got in that shape and I expected more out of myself and I did that for a period of time it changed everything for me and, and afforded these opportunities that in my wildest dreams I would I would have never thought were even possible which led to me sitting on his back porch one day smoking a cigar just like this going how the fuck did this happen <laughs> yeah well and it's crazy because people will wonder why you double down on your training now because like, this is what got me here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's you yeah. know, as you have this max effort, after you have the supplement and you have the the app that you're trying to get to scale, mm -hmm. you know, to another level, it makes fucking complete sense to me. What are you going to do? Yes. You're going to double down on the shit that's worked to get you out of a trailer, you know, that's worked to get you out of personal training. Yep. That's worked to get you basically, you know, that contact at Muffle Farm, and yep. that's worked to actually help you start these other two businesses. Correct. Like you're not going to do that now. So once again, at 45 years old, if I, you know, back squat 600 raw, then somebody's going to be like, hmm, which I know I can do. I just need to go do it. You know what I mean? So I've always set these things up for myself to go do things. Um, and, and, and literally just the proof's in the pudding always. And, and I think that now at some point, maybe I'm not going to be able to do that anymore. So I'm going to squeeze it all in now. You know what well, I mean? Well, you'll find something, trust yeah, me. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I'm sitting, I'm sitting here, you know, 15 years older than you, you'll yeah, huh? find something. There's always something. There's always something that you can target. It may yeah. not be the, the biggest change I've had to make post powerlifting is it's not 
I have a, a objective. I don't, yeah. I don't like the word goals, right? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. goals are limiting. Because yeah, what sure. if you could do better? Yeah, yeah, true. You know, I don't want to settle for just this when mm -hmm. it could be more. But the, what's changed with me is those objectives still get thrown out there, but they're more flexible. Yeah, yeah, I got Like you. I want to do this at this body weight before the end of the year. Hell yeah. Now it can happen in October. It could happen in the spring. It could happen in November. But mm -hmm. I got all fucking year, and it's going to take me sure. a long time to get there. This is not easy, yeah, yeah, whatever yeah. it is. It's going to be hard. But I'm going to swipe it whenever I can because, fuck, I may need a hip replaced. I may need something. Sir, sure. Something may push it to be there. But I'll be goddamned if I cross that year. Because for me, it's not the Arnold. It's the year end of the I year. I got you. Yep. And I'll be fucked if I'm going to. That is, it's not an option that it's not going to happen. Carrying those things fo forward is the worst fucking thing of all time. I won't. And I, and I, I did that for cover a magazine. Yeah. I carried it forward for like eight yeah. years. It fucking drove me nuts. Now, the fucked part is when you own a business and you're basing that on numbers. Yeah, I know. That sucks because then you start coming into what we have now. Yep. Right? You, you, you're, I'm sure you're gearing up for Black Friday. Too. Yeah, of course. You know, yep. A lot of the retail happens in November and December. For sure. And you come into it like, fuck, you're already kind of behind for the year. Like yep. you got to do, and you're laying it out, man. And you're like, man, I got to do this and this if I want to beat prior year. And you're like, fuck, yeah. I don't know if we can, what the fuck are you saying? You well, don't the know. strategy too. And just like, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's super challenging. I brought these. I thought you think it's cool. Mm. These are uh, Franco Colombo pamphlets. This was my first training manuals. I, I may have from. some of these out there. From 1971. Yeah. These were given to me by my stepdad. Shout out Randy Thompson. And, uh, it was like, this is the shit I was learning. This was my resources. Yeah. The Franco Colombo Book of Chests. How, how to Become More Powerful by Franco Colombo. I yeah. mean, unfucking believe. See, <laughs> the, so these are funny. These I mean, are, this was their ebooks back then. No, it was. It was back in magazines, man. You would yeah. order these things, and then they would come. And I know I have that book there. You know, the... Oh, the Unleashing the, the Physique. Yeah, 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 the old Vince Garanda book. I yeah. mean, these were my resources that I was just... You know, this is all I was studying. Yeah. And so when I got an actual chance to sit with Arnold, write the program, go through the content. I mean, we wrote a whole new voiceover on pumping irons footage that had never been seen before for the promo for that thing. Like the stuff I was getting to do, I was sitting in his office every day for five days on this old computer, just going through all the footage. And I got life-size Predator, life-size Mr. Freeze, the fucking Conan sword sitting in the corner. Like, I'd go to the bathroom and walk past the Conan sword. Like, crazy shit. And then when I was able to bring to him, like, all right, here's this sequence of a minute for the sizzle reel, and we think we should do this and do a new voiceover. Like, to be able to sit down with your idol and go through shit like that is such a different level. And then for it to actually work and him like it, it was fucking unbelievable. But it's because this is all the shit I was studying. Because I said, if I, if I lived then, I would have been there. Mm -hmm. I really believe 100% I would have been because I was so drawn to the volume and the way those guys looked. And it just, it, it taught me so much that it then lent itself to me when I actually worked with them because I knew a lot of the intricacies of that whole time frame because that was my only resource. I didn't have the fucking internet. That's got to be weird sitting there seeing that shit because I want to date myself now. I remember going to watch Conan the Barbarian in the theaters. Yeah. And I was competing in powerlifting as a teenager at the time. Yep. And I went several times to see that thing. So you know, Favorite good. parts when he cuts the guy's head off for me. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, and but to see that as a soy would have to be. Unbelievable. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, it's like one of those things where there's multiple times in parts of that where I'm in rooms or seeing things or being around people that you just never thought in a million years you would be. But then you start to remind yourself all of those things that you challenge yourself on, the work ethic, the consistency is how you got there. But I wasn't guaranteed any of it. And on top of it, I didn't even know if any of it was actually really possible. All the way back to the beginning of our conversation when I was in that personal training studio and I was and I was training clients, I already felt like I was successful. So I didn't have any like, like if I don't make this much money or I don't, I didn't have any like things like if I didn't reach it, that I wasn't a success. I was just trying to get the entry point of starting to do what I love and then be able to support myself on that. If I could do that from shoveling coal, I, to me, I was successful. Then everything I scaled from then in the taking the chances that's why I remember AJ Roberts, uh, AJ helped me a bunch too. And he was getting ready to do his own business. And he said, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, Jeeve taking all these chances and everything. And I said, AJ, I said, okay, when you're pulling your deadlift at a certain variation, are you going to take the same weight again? 
he started laughing. I go, that's what the fuck you're doing right now. Oh, he's like, that is what I'm doing. I'm like, yeah, bro. He's like, you're not taking any chances. You're not taking a new weight. I'm like, what I've consistently done is push myself and taking educated chances, just like you take educated jumps in the gym to try to get to new levels. And if you're going to do your own business or make the jump, like you have to do similar things. We had this conversation a long time ago and it's it funny because it clicked. AJ is a great business guy and mm -hmm. done some awesome stuff, but it's like, you know, and I had similar conversations with Anthony Oliveira, who I'm good friends with, and I've helped him with some business stuff, and he's helped me with some lifting stuff. And that's where a lot of, same with Ramos. Ramos went and built an amazing concrete company, and it's like the same type of things. He was asking me business stuff. I was asking him weightlifting stuff, and then vice versa. And it's like I've had these relationships with some really, really great power lifters specifically um, that would recognize that my business is a little different than most guys mm -hmm. and that they would say, like, well, what do you think about this, G? And then I'd be like, well, I got you. What do you think about when I'm in this shirt? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So I think there was a lot of trade-offs like that that was happening that a lot of people didn't realize and still don't realize that that's why I'm so, and I just love the community so much. And that I felt like in my own way, between the Arnold content, between using some of the West Side stuff in my programming and having those platforms, I was able to branch out and, and get a lot of people to know about powerlifting. Maybe a lot of people that would have never went to a meet did meets because they were doing that content. So I always felt like, even though I was doing it in a different way, I was spreading the sport. A mm -hmm. sport, whether it's bodybuilding or powerlifting, that had lent a, an entire life to me. And so that's why I think I was so passionate about it. So sometimes when I would get some like hate or whatever, which I don't really pay attention to that stuff anyway, but when I would hear it, I'm like, I don't think people realize what, like the platform I got and the amount of people that are watching, and yeah, I'm doing it my own way, but it's spreading the fucking sport. Yeah. that I love and get yeah. up every day wanting to get better at. Well, you don't pay attention to it now, but I'm sure you did back then, mm. right? I'll, so Yeah, I'll hear it, but it's like it never really changes my path. Yeah, where I think that's an important message for people today to understand that you can't let that criticism, hate, whatever you want to no. call it, suck your time away from the creative aspects that you need and to do will. to grow your business or to for make sure. your training better. Yes. Because it will. It will, it will stress you out, then you're not going to be able to recover from your training. Forget business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're always stressed out about the drama that's online, which is weird, right? Because yeah. that's not, like, real. It's not real, yeah. It's not real. But then you can't recover from your deadlifts, your training, and all this other shit because you just gave that control to a complete stranger troll yeah. online. Who doesn't probably fucking lift weights yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah, or as you said a little bit earlier that I caught – was when you're going through your socials now, you very rarely go through recreationally to look at shit because you don't have the time. You don't. You know, you don't have two hours to go through and just check your TikTok shit. Mm -mm. And if you do, what are you trading to be able to do that? Yeah, that's that's facts. And I'm looking at my trading time throwing the football with my kid. Yeah. And that's way more important. So I'm starting to like, as I got older, I've definitely tried to do a better job of that. That's why this next iteration of Corey, like when we were going back and forth, I said, I feel like I've lived like four lives. Yeah. And I'm in this other one right now that has more time with my kids and family. And it's about lifestyle. It really is. I'm doing what I love to do. And, you know, yeah, if somebody came and bought all the shit tomorrow, what the fuck would I do? I'd still get up and train. I still would want to impact mm -hmm. fucking people. Like, I don't know what would change for me. That's kind of my thing. Like, I used to, when I left MP and it didn't happen the way I wanted it to, and I was like, I'm going to build this new company, uh, Max Effort, and I'm going to sell it. And I'm looking at it like, I should be doing this for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, why not? I'm having a blast. I love the people I work with. We're, we're creating good stuff. We're getting good results. You know, at, at the end of the day, like, I don't know. I'm not in a rush anymore. I'm in a different part now. I can feel it because I'm I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I still have bullshit I got to deal with, like we both do, right? Yes, yeah. And some adversity from time to time, but yeah, getting in there and creating with some really quality people and and doing what we're doing to me, it's I look forward to it every day. So I'm in no I'm in no I'm definitely more patient than I've ever been for sure. Are there any topics or questions that you thought I would ask that I didn't ask? Um, no, I think you hit. You know, here's what I'll tell you is. One, I really appreciate that you you did a little bit of a digging on the book and stuff. That was that was really cool. Like I didn't I didn't never even thought about that at, at all. I figured you'd ask about training and stuff like that. I never come into things like this thinking it's going to go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. The only thing I was a little bit thinking about was like we don't know each other that well. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know who you know that either likes or dislikes me, so I wasn't really sure what your thoughts were about me. And, you know, all the training guys that I know that know you had nothing but great things to say. So I come in here with a really optimistic mm -hmm. mind, really excited to see the gym. And at the end of the day, we've both been doing this for so long, Dave. We're here for a reason. So. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I kept thinking. I was like, why don't I know this guy? And why don't we, Same you know, thing. and that's so I was excited about today yeah. and was a little nervous because of maybe the past things like we just had never crossed paths and maybe good, bad or indifferent. But like I was optimistically excited to come and just chat today. So I, I, I really appreciate the time. But no, I think you asked you gave me a chance to really kind of tell my story and kind of how I got here. So that was cool. No, I appreciate you coming. Out. I was thinking the same thing or, you know, I was like, why in the hell? You know, this is, <laughs> and it's the same city. I mean, it's a, relatively within the same 60 miles yeah. or whatever it's going to be. Not no more, though. Which is just fucking weird, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, how can people find you? Yeah. Um, or what's, it, not, I hate that question. What's the best way? Yeah. Like, so, where do you want to send people? Yeah, the best way is, like, any of the platforms or Corey G Fitness, and it sounds funny because that wasn't, like, my first choice. It was just the thing that was available <laughs> to mm -hmm. everything. I feel like I was ahead of that till everybody had fit. But anyway, Corey G Fitness, C-O-R-Y-G Fitness, and then MaxEffortMuscle.com for the supplements. And we're doing a lot of stuff, like, starting to um, – you know, send a lot of stuff to different powerlifting organizations and starting to really try to get back into the roots with the supplements to support the sport. And, you know, one of the things I'm really proud of too, and I forgot to mention, like C.T. Fletcher, Mark Bell even, like in a lot of the West Side dudes, I was early in just supporting the sport and supplements with the other company. And now that I'm kind of back um, looking at that whole type of thing, I'm look, working on budgets to get stuff to meets and do things. So it's like, I'm here to maybe give you a different approach, but I'm here for the same fucking craziness. Mm -hmm. I love every day getting under the bar. I love the fucking meets. I'm getting just as excited to see the young kids get PRs and get, you know, challenge people on the website. But it's like, you know, the programming's over on the app at Corgi Fitness, just on iPhone or whatever. Supplements at MaxEffortMuscle.com. And um, I appreciate everything. No, I appreciate coming out. Guys, thank you for watching, listening, and we are done. You know what?